essentially we're all good to go. So yeah. awesome. Happy days. Oh, happy. So I want to hear the rest of the story. Oh sorry. Aye, so basically <laughs> so well, we had his number and that so I tried I tried to, to phone and that and then just fucking it was like a receptionist and that and he ended up he fucked his back. So I don't uh, know if you remember it because they played with, they were playing the Milton Keynes bowl with Deftones. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we all had tickets for it and that. This was like maybe two weeks after the, the massage or whatever. And um but she didn't get back until like a week and after I tried to phone the number and that and fucking nothing happened. Oh. Um but uh, he fucked his back so I had to cancel the full tour. So we used to always slag my sister saying you fucked Fred's back, man. But, um, you fucked a whole limp biscuit to <laughs> <laughs> But uh aye, so I'm, I still hate that wee guy for for fucking us there man because he I'll just had a label lesson, as well never fucking <clears throat> give up an opportunity just, for the shag aye exactly well there you go it's not like dick's hard to come by no offence guys <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of punnery in that comment in itself it? I'm glad we started <laughs> I'm glad we started the way we did <laughs> I think we can just start in there then. aye absolutely we'll start with Debbie saying that <laughs> dicks are not hard to come by <laughs> is the title in, of this yeah, well, podcast fucking three in this room man so, eh? in both senses of the face <laughs> yeah so guys how's it going Good, thanks. Good, mate. Good to see you again. It's been a long time. I know. So, the, me and Bruce are cool. We're glad to get over it and catch up with right. you guys. And uh, you have got, had a lot of shit going on. Yeah. And that's totally. why we're coming over to talk to you. So, it's all we're going to talk about. <laughs> oh, yeah. All the shit. <laughs> Probably reminisce, no doubt, a lot about uh, everything else back in the day. But, uh, Topic at hand, Debbie, how are you doing? I'm doing really good, thank how's you. How's the recovery? It's going amazing. It's been plain sailing so far. I'm feeling really good. For people that don't know, tell them what's happening. The recovery to alcoholism. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I've just went under my second hip replacement. I was born with a condition called hip dysplasia, where my hip joints basically weren't formed properly. So I had some surgery when I was younger and... It wasn't completely successful. So, um, what age was that? Three. Wow. A few years ago. <laughs> I'll not say how many. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so I had my first hip replacement seven years ago, and this is my second one. So, full hip replacement. Um, the last one was completely successful. So, I'm really, really excited about the recovery of this. But the recovery's been really smooth so far, and I'm feeling great. Okay, that's it. So after this one, that's you, free yep. and clear. Yep, until I'm an old lady. You don't need, lady. need three hips. <laughs> <laughs> you go. Basically, she's Wolverine. Aye. aye. Adamantium <laughs> exoskeleton installed. I heal like fuck as well. Mm-hmm. So I it? heal like Courtesy fuck. Courtesy the NHS. <laughs> so what did, you, what did you have to deal with on a day-to-day basis? Was that something that got progressively worse? Oh, yeah, definitely. Since I was a little girl, I've had a little bit of pain. Um, I used to get shin splints quite easily, back pain. Um, but over the years it just got progressively worse but it got to a point where it's like a little bit worse a little bit worse but when it hits bad it declined really really quickly Um, it went from bad to horrific my last hit I would say I let it get worse because I was um, really anticipating the the hip replacement but I, I could barely walk by that point but this time I was a little bit more on the ball because I knew what, what I was expecting so I was really like eager to get it done so I would say it was really bad um, I had to um, for those that don't know I'm a performer and a tattoo artist both of those things take quite a toll on your posture and your legs and your back and all those other things so it really was affecting my careers which I, I didn't like <laughs> in the slightest I'm a career girl so yeah I, I just bit the bullet went to my doctor they seen the state of my hips and I got the go ahead so yeah here I am <laughs> I was going to say how did that affect you then day to day like you're obviously you're a big big presence on social media and stuff like yeah. that yeah promoting a, a quite excellently positivity and stuff yeah. like that but for you to begin through that there must have been some days you'd be oh, from black feeling absolute shit to- you know what I mean and more more days than not towards the end um, not do you only- feel pressure to try and keep that positivity up when you're going through a bit of a rough time I would say I could feel pressure, but I I don't, I choose not to. I try and be as honest as possible. Um, I'm pretty honest about my mental health struggles. I'm pretty honest about my shit days as well as my good days because I think they're equally as important um, for the people that are watching you. So, 
yeah, I did get really down, but I actually decided that I was going to try and speak to people about it and yeah, just be really honest, you know, and tell people like, do you know what, this is shit, but I believe it's going to be okay. And I think I was so focused on the other side that I was more excited about. It felt like seeing your future right in front of you, yeah, you know. Yeah, and so some days, yeah, that's frustrating, but other days it's exciting. Yeah. You know, it's a lot of up and downs. See me, see me, your, me, your, me, your mental health. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose it's quite early to get in this road, but it's, no, not it's, at all. It's, a it's common, fine. It's a common ground for a lot of people. I mean, yep. for for those that might might not, I'm sure your close friends do, but yeah, you know, what particular well, things have you struggled with? Uh, most of my life, it was diagnosed as anxiety, but two years ago, I went for a full assessment, which I'd never had, and I get diagnosed with um, anxiety, depression, and OCD. Um, I think the OCD maybe goes hand in hand with the other issues. I'm not really sure. Since then, I've been at psychotherapy for almost a year. I've been in medication, which can be controversial, but personally for me, it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. It's been the best thing I've ever done for myself. And Kevin initially, my husband, was saying that he was really, really dubious about it. But even he agreed after a few months that it was probably the best thing I've ever done. Sorry. sorry. No, on you go, sorry. Did I take out to see for your, um, when you're taking your medication, did it take a while to kick in? Yeah, it probably takes about five weeks. I mean, I would say in the first couple of weeks, I was very elated um, and on such a high, which is really quite dangerous sometimes for people with mental yeah. health struggles because you always know you get the high, then you get the crash. Um, but it started to level out and I would say after, yeah, the five, six weeks, I just... It's a really strange thing. It's uh, I said to Kevin, it's is this how other people feel? You know, just feeling normal, not feeling so concerned about things, and not feeling really just that big weight off your shoulders. And it was an amazing feeling. Um, as I said, I'm, it doesn't work for everybody, but it, it worked for me. You know, yeah. and I'm glad it happened. <clears throat> it's true that I think it's it's an individual thing, and I've, I've spoke to a, a few people that have that have um, experienced the same. Mm-hmm. And on one hand, um, you know, one example being that, yeah, they have felt that elation. Mm -hmm. They've not felt down about anything else. But on the other hand, they've not had any other feeling whatsoever. Yeah. So that almost makes them lose themselves a little bit. So they want to come off that medication again, but are scared to because they don't want to go back into that that depth of depression again. So I think that's that, you know, I think everyone has different experiences with it. Totally. I had a different experience with it in the fact of when I... uh, when I was prescribed antidepressants, I didn't want them. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, I don't think I need them. I think that's maybe not for me. I think the doctor had said, well, that's possibly why they will work for you. And yep. I'm like, all right, I'll give it a try. And I, I forget the ones he prescribed, but the first night I took them, I was just violently, violently sick the oh, entire night just because God. it just didn't agree with me. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? And it just applied, I can't, I can't take them. I've just been sick for six hours. Do you know what I mean? Did you not take them again after that? Never took them again after that. Um, maybe you just had a bad curry, mate. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> that maybe went hand in hand. Maybe I shouldn't have had them the same night I had them at <laughs> last. <laughs> you could have been happy as fuck, man. Ah, <laughs> oh, those days are gone. <laughs> I have, um, I've heard about the numbness thing. Very luckily, I, I don't get that. I don't get it at all. I don't know if I've just did too much going on in my head that it was more of a calm sense. But I would say that I've not experienced that side of it and I'm really glad because I think that would put me off. The main thing I worried about was my creativity being stinted. Uh, That was always my concern about going on medication because it is a stereotype, but you say like creativity comes from like the darkest places sometimes, you know. Definitely. But I would say that that hasn't happened to me, fortunately. (laughs) Fortunately. (laughs) Kev, what did did you see from your point of view going through however many months or I don't know how long it's you know it's been did you see ups and downs did you see total changes day to day or whatever how did you deal with that or? aye mate kind of creeped up on me a wee bit because when I met Debbie she was just like this big personality like just bright bubbly always had something to say like surrounded by people very similar to her um, and being away with the band and whatever else you would come back and you would just think like she'd be messaging you saying like I'm really not in a good place today like I'm feeling sad and you would strange for me mate because like I don't get any of this at all like grew up in a nice place with surrounded by like an amazing family um, 
and I just wasn't subjected to it at all. Like Debbie will always kind of have a laugh that like me and like most of my pals like grew up in families where the parents are still together and we were pals with people in that sort of scenario where mm -hmm. brought up in, in happy places um, and Debbie's upbringing couldn't have been any more different from that. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, the hardest part about it was trying to rationalise it when really there wasn't any rationale to it whatsoever. That's interesting. So it's like, Debbie would say to me, like, oh, I'm really, I'm not in a good place today. Like, I'm struggling. Like, I feel down. I can't get myself up. And my automatic reaction to that is somebody who's thinking about it with a, a what I would perceive to be a normal state of mind is, yeah. what have you got to be upset about? Like, you're, you've got a roof over your head. Like, there's food in the cupboards. You've got money in the bank. You've got an amazing job. You're surrounded by amazing people. Like, what could you possibly have to be upset about? And she would just be like, it would always start fights and stuff like that, but it got to the point where she was like, I want to go and speak to somebody about this. And I'm thinking to myself, fucking hell, like, is this getting worse because of something I've done? Because it wasn't always like that. It just yeah. seemed to creep up on it. But I think Debbie was maybe just putting on her face to a certain extent. And then it reached a point where we'd moved back out to East Bride. And I'm thinking, have I taken her away from somewhere that she was happier when she was there? And just a lot of that there but when Debbie went on to the medication it was like getting the last if he, like three or four met. years ago back again um, and it was like but it, it, even then it's different because <clears throat> because of the, obviously as she said about the hip replacement and stuff like that Debbie has been on ridiculous strength painkillers for as long as I've known her so when the first hip replacement was done she came off the painkillers and it was like this section of her life where everything was good and then when you came off them when she came off them yeah so she comes off the first set of painkillers and then the left leg is no longer giving her pain but because she's now reliant on that leg to avoid having to put pressure on the other one this one starts giving her a lot of jip and we go to the doctor and the doctor says you just need to put up with it for as long as you possibly can until that becomes unbearable you really don't want to be going through with this trauma again because we were in a flat it was one up like try to yeah. get in and out of the place it was a, it was a real <clears throat> nightmare yeah. um, so through the course of the second tip that was a lot longer to kind of get to the point where she was ready to go through with that um, that surgery again so the painkillers start to cause problems with her stomach um, and I just feel like everything's all, all connected I felt like the doctors whenever she went to speak to them just palmed her off with whatever was the simplest solution to get her out of the office the quickest um, yeah. and it was like this big cocktail of painkillers um, antidepressants um, medicine for um, low th underactive thyroid um, just like everything all kind of coming into one and for me it was just about seeing this journey of taking one stage at a time coming off the painkillers because you're not taking the painkillers you're no longer destroying your stomach lining so you're not having mm -hmm. to take the um Naproxen, a meprazole, um, and then it just kind of it kicks on to the point where all she's really got is the antidepressants and the the obviously the thyroid you can do nothing about, but yep. she would look at it and at that point it's a decision for Debbie to make to say I've been taking these tablets for a long time, am I in a position to come off of them or am I going to remain on them? And if she did stay on them, it's not a problem, you know. Like, yep. but for me, I just wish someone had taken her by the hand a long time ago and said, right we're going to sort out all this medication. You can't be on this whilst you're on that because it's going to be causing problems because it's, she's a party girl at the end of the day. Like She's always going to want to go out and get steaming and drink with her pals and yeah. try telling her that when you go out the night because of the medication that you're on, you, you can't have a drink. Right, and she's her own it. problem, but she's never been wanting to let it get in the way of her social life. That's so. crazy. So how, how long were you on the, the painkillers for then? Um, I've been on and off painkillers most of my adult life. I used to buy like just like your normal, normal paracetamol and ibuprofen, but as the pain escalated, the painkillers escalated, definitely. I would say like Kevin has touched on and I, I do agree that the painkillers can't help, but I wasn't great even before the painkillers, but yeah. it, it does become a stage where it's hard to see. It's hard to see where one starts and one ends, you know. Is there a, 
I mean, is there an addiction there, or is there a fear of an addiction there? There will be. There's no, there's no way that I have been on the strongest codeine, tramadol, like etc. Yep. for this amount of time, and there not be some sort of reliance. Um, and you can't come off them quickly either. The last time I had to come off them very slowly, like by reducing it by like half a tablet each time. And it's something I'm aware of, so I feel good that I'm aware of it. Yeah. But someone did ask me recently, do you get any support for that? Because the doctors must know. They tell you it's addictive. So yeah. they're just telling you to keep taking them. That's, I can't yep. get my head It's that. mental and they're so addictive. They are. And people end up ruining their lives over these things. But I'm conscious of it and I feel I feel good about that. And I know that over time, like I will start reducing them as soon as I can. Because I, I don't want to be in that position of, mm -hmm. I don't, like, I don't want a medication addiction on top of anything else, you know, yeah. so, yeah. I think you do get people with addictive personalities as well, I do yeah. believe that, I think that no, it's, totally. it's, it's easier for people that maybe don't, just to kind of say, I'm going to kick this and yeah. they can do it, whereas for some other people some it might people, be the they do hardest addictive. thing in the world. I luckily don't have an addictive personality, like, I didn't really struggle to quit smoking or anything, yeah. so... I find that I'm I'm lucky in that sense, but if like you're saying, if you're not that lucky, you won't come off them, and the doctors would just yeah. would, they would just keep giving me them. They wouldn't ask me to stop. I could keep going to the doctors every week and saying I want I want new painkillers, and they would keep doing it. Mm -hmm. I would go and pick up the prescription from the doctors, and they would say um, the doctors got a letter for Debbie to go along with these. So I would pick up the, the tablets from the pharmacy, bring them up the road. And Debbie would just look at the same letter that they've maybe given her a dozen times over the course of the last year or so. Um, and it's just, please note, look, these tablets can be addictive. Like, you need to be careful of when you're taking them. But she would, I remember, like, when we first met, the pain in her left hip must have been just excruciating, like, to the point where it was subconscious. She'd be sleeping and she was, like, whimpering in her sleep because of the God. pain coming from her hip, like, almost crying and then she would get up and she'd be like I need to take painkillers but I worry about it I, I think in the same way that when we when we first met Debbie had she'd been smoking casually like on a night out like if she had a couple of bevies or whatever she would have a cigarette yep. um, and then when we went out for one of the first times I was like I says look if you need to pull over like to get a cigarette or whatever just let me know and I'll stop the car but she's like no I'm trying to chuck it and I was like well thank fuck for that because you weren't getting a winch if you did now <laughs> stinking See, um, she's made a promise to my dad that on the 1st of July she's going to give him all her painkillers and she's going to try and right. come off of them because at that point you'll have been yes. three and a half months out of operation. <clears throat> right. So she's going to try and cut and I'm trying everything to reduce out them. entirely. Aye, because you need to reduce the... I'm, I am Mate, it was eight tramadol a day at one point, like two at four hour intervals. Wow. Mm. Just... Constantly yeah, and, and and for somebody who is as creative as Debbie, it, it must stifle your creativity because I noticed it as well. Like when she was in a good place, she would be sitting, she'd be drawing. There would be like you couldn't see the desk for like sketches and bits of ideas that she had. And she's got this iPad Pro now, and she's kind of starting to pick it up again. But I'm seeing that since the operation because she's starting to reduce her intake of it. There's got to be some sort of correlation between the painkillers, the mental health, the like yep. well, everything does, else that goes help, along with it no not at all it doesn't help definitely doesn't help because it confuses your mindset completely mm -hmm. must it's quite interesting to hear I don't know what just happened to have my voice um, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> me bother Gollum it's, uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting to hear you like obviously come from obviously just a, a, a pretty perfect mm. uh, what do you call it mate it was like the pure dad's the, 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 the Brady like, Bunch you know uh, like, uh -huh. Perfect. Uh, uh, the type of family that when I was we, I seen them on TV and didn't think they were real, like the pure Christmas jumpers in the open fire and shit. You know, um, <laughs> just <laughs> that's my family. And I'm <laughs> I, I didn't know that. I was like, I don't know any cunt weather. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. But mate, are you sure it's your dad? <laughs> see, see, honestly, like when when I think about my pals, like Daniel and like seemingly and stuff like that, like they're all families. Like that are still together and like they see each other like at least once a week. Like mm -hmm. they'll be down for like a Chinese on a Sunday night or whatever else. And then I look at all Debbie's pals, and I see a group of people who their parents are separated, or they've had like troublesome childhoods and like real problematic. And I don't know whether there's like those people are drawn to one another. 
and d- maybe comes back to like that um, like Debbie used to hang about at the gallery she's a heavy goth <laughs> back in the day and those people were all drawn to one another probably through a connection to music more than anything else wasn't it yeah um, music but for, first and then I a sense of community where there was no other sense of community for us I'd say oh absolutely yeah. you know a little bit of reliance on each other when we didn't have it anywhere else but it's it's hard because I'm not a psychologist like I look at a situation and try and take it at face value and as I say that like constant need to try and put myself in a situation where I could understand where Debbie was coming from she would say something to me like like she doesn't sleep with she can't go to sleep in this as a light on in the room like it's got to be a light source coming from somewhere doesn't like the dark Mm -hmm. fear of death like constantly like that just anxious edge to her all the time Um, there's got to be something there that links the two and as I said when I try and look at it in a rational way like I try and put myself into a position where I've had a similar experience and a lot of the time I'm just like I don't I don't have anything to offer like I can't I think that's the thing I think you get to a point where you just need to accept it you're not going to understand it Mm -hmm. to that point you're just going to go right you know I'm not going to understand this I just need to listen and yeah I don't know, be supportive the best I can. Yeah. You know, it's it's tough. That's a really, really tough thing to do is not, it if you can understand tough. it, how, you know, that can be frustrating. That can be, mm. you know, you can maybe yeah. get angry at that. It could, yep. it could, but, you know, you've obviously done everything the, the right way. Oh, of course, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, I, I think there's a lot of folk play. in the world with, with that kind of mindset. However, they deal with it very differently and that's why there's probably such a big problem around mental yeah. health and it's why it's so good to talk about it you've you've got a very kind of big social media kind of presence in your life mm-hmm. and if you are talking about it like you've kind of said that's I know it's a, became like a pure cliche but like if you don't talk about it and you don't get your stories out there people will always never understand yeah. where it comes from totally. so obviously you've been kind of forced to, yeah. to kind of like understand it or that but uh, I mean, that's that's all you can say. You just need to really kind of talk about it and educate people because there's still such a horrendous. Oh, definitely, like, definitely. It's interesting, you know, it. you know, when we're talking about you know yourself being a a big social media presence. Obviously, Debbie, you're a tattoo artist, you're a performer, you're a uh, model. Is there any, you know countless other things that you must do creatively? <laughs> but um, that must beckon for a lot of shit talking online as well oh, amongst totally. everything else. So. Totally. All those people that are keyboard warriors clearly don't know that side of mental health and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. are you, if you had that strength to not let that affect you, or does that really hit home sometimes when you're not having a good day? If people are being like, as people do online, do you know what I mean? Start mm-hmm. talking shit, or do you get a lot of that? Do you get? Um, have you had a lot of it in the past? Is I, I have, yeah, not just online, but in real life as well. Um, right. I've had it quite often. I would say it affected me more when I was younger. So would you mean, would you, sorry, would you mean on the, on the street? No, well, like within our, our scene, for want of a better word, you right, know, okay. like shit talking. I've had things wrote about me on a bathroom wall, like just crazy stuff. Um, obviously, as Kevin said, I, I'm aware of the fact that I am a big personality and that, that does draw attention, whether good or bad. So, yeah, I've kind of always dealt with it. But I would say it was much harder when you're younger. You you do this big, brave, early 20s, like, I don't give a fuck what people yeah. say. But you're just being as defiant as anyone else, you know, mm. you're pretending. But I would say now I, I've really made peace with it. It doesn't really faze me. Um, I let it wash over me a lot. And I think a lot it has to do with mental health. I more think about, like, why would someone feel the need to do that? What's going on with them? And yeah. I think because I'm so interested in mental health and not just from my perspective, I think a lot about why people do the things they do. And I think when you put things into perspective like that, it really helps you deal with it because you you see that it's not because a person hates you or you've done anything wrong, you know. And I think when you rationalise things like that, you, you start to see it very differently, you know. And yeah. I'll, you mentioned like my positive output. 90% of the time, I'm positive... I'm trying to be positive in front of people because it helps me feel positive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like one of those things that's self-medicating almost. So by me doing that, I'm able to rise above and and I I try and use my experiences 
even with that to be relatable and help mm-hmm. other girls see that not just girls boys as well like or whatever in between you know yeah um to see that yeah this is going to happen but it's okay you know and you can deal with it and it's fine it's interesting there was a an experiment not an experiment I, I hate the word but there was a, a thing on social media that related to that and it was this girl that I forget who she was on social media or what she was putting out on social media whether she was a model or something like that but she was overweight she was she wasn't classed like let's say the prettiest girl yeah. in the world um and people were sending her just horrible messages through social media saying, oh, you're this and you're that and you're this and you're that. Uh-huh. But she replied with nothing but kindness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right, okay. And it's the best okay, thing to do. not everyone got back and and said whatever, but a large percentage of people actually wrote back and said, I'm quite surprised that you messaged me back with such a nice message and it totally turned things around. Mm-hmm. Good. Do you know what I mean? And that's like it, it shows you that, like you're saying, like these people that send these messages, what's wrong with them? What what yep. angst or what There's mental health are they struggling with? So mm-hmm. the fact that they've kind of that connected on something's kind of made them realise, okay, look, wait a minute here, mm-hmm. you know. So that's obviously a good thing. Must be difficult to say rather than say fuck off, you uh-huh. arsehole. Aye. Aye. But uh, <laughs> you know, look at Mickey, you, you prick. That's it. Actually, yeah. that's the west of Scotland. You actually get slag or beef slag. <laughs> <fucking mate. laughs> I mean, usually I can be lot, like good with it, but if my friends get there first, it's a different story. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> if they see it, then no, <laughs> it's gone. Well, that's definitely a good bunch of pals. There, that's for sure. <laughs> positivity, positivity mm-hmm. does always. Positivity. Always. Positivity. 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 You can see that again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on fire the day, man. <laughs> yeah. Now that's 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 mental. But it's funny to see your output as well because, like, I can imagine a lot of folk that are like big into social media and stuff I don't really bother like I I don't really post all that much I just kind of see what everybody else is doing what is it I think it? that's because we're getting old mate I think so I just I, I don't have a Facebook anymore and I just kind of I, I call Kevin a lurcher he's always on Instagram never <laughs> posts I'm like you're a fucking lurcher <laughs> listen then quality over quantity <laughs> do you want to know how many beers I had tonight <laughs> bet they do but um, <laughs> I, I think that the thing about Debbie's content is the honesty of it like <clears throat> she can post up like if we're away on holiday and having a nice time or whatever but you'll also get the I'm not really having a great day today going to send me yeah. pictures of your dugs post as well I've actually seen a my couple of them I actually, I, I, my usual go to I've actually seen one said by the way did I no mention I mentioned I want to see pictures of your dugs I, get uh-huh. on board with us That's that it. was almost like having a go at the whole community say yeah. listen you've not heard me the first time uh-huh. they, get these they listened dogs. they listened uh-huh. but don't woe betide whoever would send her a photo of a baby when she asks for a picture of a dog <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to see your baby no, no that's it. I, I said this I do like babies but only the ones I know I and don't know like, interesting if, Know the, if know. I know your baby, well, like, like, like Craig, keeping, I would, I'd, be, I'd be like, your baby's means. quite cool, but if it's a stranger on the street, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not interested. In, unless it's doing something pretty cool, then I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but show me your dog any day. <laughs> show me your dogs. <laughs> but you're, so you get all the like the nice pictures, like if like we're in holiday and like if I've had a nice meal or whatever, but you also get the, by the way, like, this, is, this is the scar that I've been left with for the rest of my life. And it's like that, like down there. And yeah. it's just like, like, bearing her soul for everybody to see and it's hard to get on board with that as well because I'm quite shielded as a person like yep. I don't put everything out there for everybody to see but Debbie's just like here's my scar like this is what I'm thinking just now like just everything's just out there for but um, it seems strange to people but if you've seen the messages I get from people like thanking me and resonating with it and just how it's helped them it's worth it. Yeah, of course it would be. It's it's worth if you can wear your heart in your sleeve for people. If we all wore our hearts in our sleeves, we wouldn't be as insecure. We wouldn't see the world the way we do. Like we would all understand each other a little bit better. And I'm a very liberal person, and I empathise a lot. I've got a lot too much empathy at times, and I think because of that, it it drives me to be that way, you know, and and try and touch people a little bit and touch the hearts and help them relate to each other a little bit better because it's so easy to judge things when we don't understand them mm-hmm. and that's always my biggest point and it's what divides the world right now is a lack of understanding and we, we don't get things so I just feel like I've got a duty I've got a platform and I want yeah. to use it Aye, but can you see like can you see where I'm coming oh, of from of course like, I can not everyone wants to yeah. release their private you, life you obviously you know? you've got your own problems right uh-huh. but 
you are just, I mean, I suppose if everybody was like that, the world would be a better place, but yeah. you are so quick to want to solve everybody else's problems. <laughs> mm. you, you take the weight of everybody else's world and it's you're like in shooters. You, mm-hmm. just, <laughs> that's probably a very <laughs> good <laughs> fucking happy We, balance, meeting, we balance, balance each around. other out. We're like, very young, yeah. See, when, <clears throat> see when, when she was going through all this, she's before she took the tattoo apprenticeship on, um, she'd kind of floated from job to job, worked in Hellfire. Um, <laughs> again, just... Uh, for anyone that doesn't know Hellfire, it was the most mosh up shop <laughs> in all of Glasgow. I, know, uh, <laughs> I worked in the actually, but I've got a oh, funny story about I, I used to work downstairs and for flip. one day. Oh, right. I oh, worked in flip for one day. That's what did brilliant. you do? I jacked in uni. I was doing a computer programming degree at uni. This is going back fucking <laughs> 2001, maybe 2002. And I was like, oh, I sack this shit. And I uh, walked down from Glasgow uni. Uh, jumped into fuck. I was like, can I get a job? And the kid went, aye, alright, come in the morning. <laughs> and I was like, Brilliant. All right. and, then, Hi. and he's like, right, just stand by these change rooms and make sure nobody nicks in. I stood there for eight hours. Oh my and God. And I was like, eh, horrendous, eh? I'm away. And I never even asked for money. I was like, fuck this. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> oh. I won't be back tomorrow. This was no fun. All those shops, like, they just wanted you to feel the glory of being like in the, the Mosher Empire oh, yeah. so you were meant to put with other shite for oh. <laughs> see, see Hellfire was that is that the one that was across the that was on Queen Street aye I, yeah. I've got a well good yep. story there oh, right? oh do you <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it was coming up on Halloween night and I was wanting to go as David Bowie like yeah. can, uh, what do you call it like can you imagine this count as Bowie? No. <laughs> By the way, I think for the Depends benef- what Bowie. For the benefit of the camera, I know he might not look at the new, but back in the day, he was the handsomest <laughs> cunt oh. in the whole fucking, honestly. Right, he just got me, man. He just had to <laughs> fucking snap his fingers and people wanted to, to was just People wanted there. to be Bruce, didn't they? Aye. Fucking Stupid hell. Man, no chance. I've seen him in silver hot pants, so <laughs> Well, this is a kind of similar story, man. <laughs> it was, uh, I was basically getting a silver body suit, right? <laughs> <laughs> so as love always in life, I love a big love fan of silver, silver man. I just got another one gold um, but I, so I went in and I wanted this fucking <clears throat> full body suit really tight and as always in life I've always wore things a bit too tight right so <laughs> my, my, my pal at the time Barry Lee was with me and I went in and got like a size well too small this the body suit right it's like lycra or whatever spandex I don't know what it was and anyway so I'm in the changing room trying to get this on really fucking tight and it just ripped, ripped the full <gasps> fucking thing. Like, so it was like 50 quid or something like that. Right? And I was like, I was like, opened the cup. I was like, Barry, fucking ripped it. I kind of get it off. Like the, the zip was actually caught, right? And Barry just fucking ran out the shop. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, just totally left me, right? So I had to get, I had to get the guy that worked there. And he had to fucking pick me out of this thing. Then I had to leave, just fucking left oh the place. Oh my God. What did so you like, me? Mate, I can't get out. <laughs> Honestly, I was like, I was like, Barry, mate. Help. And he was like, oop. Help. <laughs> so, fuck you, Barry. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, that's but, excellent. Um, you probably fucked my bonus that much. I probably am. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. But uh, that was that's my only time I was in there. But, <laughs> but uh, you, you were the manageress in there, weren't you? And then yeah. she went, kind of floated from job to job when I'd met her. Like without any real aim of going well, anywhere. I'd just always that. been in retail and I was a retail manager, but I, I fucking hated it. I she got did. to that point where I was scunnered with it. Hey, and I was like, what am I going to do? I'd so when did, you, when did you meet? We met in uh, 2010. Well, 2009 it still was. Aye. Yeah, 2009. We were both going out with other people, actually. And we met at um, our pal Rushy's birthday. She clocked me, couldn't keep her eyes off me. My that was arse, it, like most people. My <laughs> arse. <laughs> it was like me, when I seen you at that college. Thanks, <laughs> though, college. She looked over at me and she went, Is that Bruce with Seven Stone Light? <laughs> <laughs> we were <laughs> fucking twins, to be fair, man. <laughs> aye. Triplets. But, um, but I so used to say about you as well. She, um, so she was kind of floating around retail jobs and then um, it was like, it was like the bit in Clerks, but um, it was like, what do you want me to do? It's like, <laughs> buy the quick stop. And I just knew exactly what she wanted to do. And it was like, you need to, she was working in the tattoo studio part-time, but like doing the printing, like t-shirts and stuff. I was like, tell Ian, you want the fucking apprenticeship? And it was like the penny dropped. And she was like, actually, this is where I want to be. It's what I want to do. Um, 
And I thought, because at the time she was kind of talking about, oh, I want to go into social work and all that. And I was like, hen, you're the last person that should be helping them day. Like, <laughs> what can they fucking sort out your own house? Never mind them day elsies. And, That's um, the support you're after. They're, they're the best people to help, probably. <laughs> but, and, and then, so <clears throat> through the tattooing, I think it's been an, a, a, like a vehicle for her to use it to meet people. Because, I mean, think about like people, or m- the majority of people who are kind of to get tattooed, the tattoos get a meaning and mm. the majority yeah. of the times it's like something which is quite poignant to them or whatever else and something that means something to them yeah. so Debbie's there to facilitate that yeah I would say I'm getting the best of both worlds I'm getting art is my passion but my other passion is talking to people and helping people and I definitely am getting the best of both worlds because I feel like when people go to get tattooed they they talk to you about things that they wouldn't even probably talk to their friends about and it's incredible and you do relate to each other and you chat and it's amazing so yeah, I would say I'm getting a bit of both outlets where I feel like I'm helping a little bit as well as getting to be artistic. <laughs> That's cool. Aye. But if she could trade it all in to be back in Hellfire, then you do it in a spandex suit she would make. Imagine, oh, big imagine that edit, was man. you putting Bruce's face at the no. cup. I've, I've lapped a hen. <laughs> You'll need to help me. You'll need to help me. No, I've got to run away. I can't even let you. That was... Uh, I, I've had a couple of weird Super changing fun. room stories, man. I was in, uh, I mind I was in Levi's in the Cannon Galleries one time, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so this, there was this bird that was working there, and she was like, um, needing any help, and I was like, I'll take this. So she, she got me a pair of jeans and shirt or whatever. So I'm in the in the dressing room just getting changed and that, and she's just just lap peering over, right? <gasps> I was like, what the fuck? I was like, seven or eight. She's like, aye, aye, I've no bad. How are you getting on in that? And then she's just talked to me as I was like in my box. I was like, so odd, man. So just, what happened? I just, I just kind of got, got Did dressed you go out? and. Uh, go out for a date? No. <laughs> she really definitely odd, had a, ham, do that a wee ham shank when she went home, didn't she? <laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> Uh, I did. Did you, did you have your long johns on though? You got up there? Oh, no, 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 that night, man. There it is. Make the last tables about Oh, there. mate. That is my fucking best story, mate. I fucking, honestly, mate, that's, that's there's too actually long better than that. There's actually better Bruce stories than that. I think the cat house choking one was a fucking belter as well. <laughs> what? The, the what? What? <laughs> what? Yeah, that's, I think that's too long ago there. Ah, sorry, we can, we can talk about this off camera. Anyway, um, <laughs> Aye. 2009 you, were, you must have been in the band at that point weren't you? yeah aye what um, was, where, I can't remember how, that's going back a while whereabouts were you at that point? well how? I joined the band in December 2008 so right. Michael Rice had left the band and um, the band decided they didn't want to just kind of leave it in abeyance and they were going to try and kind of move on with a new vocalist um, so December 2008 I joined the band so throughout 2009 we were basically up and down to Longwave to record with <coughs> Mesh to try and finish Absolutely. the album so it was like we would organise weekenders because everybody had jobs at the time like Paul's yeah. a painter and decorator like I was still uh, part of the Youth Access project up at John Wheatley College um, back where we recorded our first single that's it mate <laughs> aye. up in the office no even in the studio we were just in like one of the computer rooms um, we're but, in the studio listen we were in the studio aye. <laughs> it's a real single the producer mm. Pharrell was in there mixing and all that it's a real single but um, I so everybody was working we would go away and do like sort of like long weekenders so we'd do like a kind of Friday, Saturday, Sunday night to try and generate money to record the next batch of songs so we recorded the album over the period of a year doing three tunes at a time at, at uh, Ramesh at, at Longwave Ramesh at Longwave yeah so we had <laughs> amazing pals Lauren and Reed down in Cardiff that put us up whenever we were there brilliant um, and we went down and recorded the album so for all intents and purposes it really shouldn't have worked because it, the album was written and recorded over a period of a year so Aye, you would think nuts, isn't it? Yeah. the songs at the end of it would have been much different from the songs at the beginning of it but it just sat really nice so Good. by the time 2010 came about we should really have been going on a headline tour, but we were offered an opportunity to go out with Glamour of the Kill, which was the best thing we ever done because yeah. they were just, they were so so tight with us. We ended up, we're still pals now after yes. nearly 10 years, you know. But I met Debbie, it was maybe September or October 2009. So as she says, the two of us were otherwise engaged. Um, but we kind of had a chat on that night and blethered away and the two years were just stood at the bar and it left everybody else to get on with it and that was it and I didn't really hear anything about Debbie until I found out that she was no longer with 
our boyfriend. Um, <laughs> I was saying so, our boyfriend. <laughs> uh-huh. He was an absolute loser, mate, honestly. <laughs> what um, is his name? Shout out, shout out to him. <laughs> <laughs> Tag him in the he post. Was. You know who you are. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, mate, he's a fucking paraffin lamp. <laughs> <laughs> um, but aye, so when I found out the two of them had split up, I wasn't with my wasn't he with my fiance anymore um, and we met at it was the Glasgow show but it was mm. funny as fuck because Debbie was there as a PR for Triple G who were managing Yashin at the time so she was standing at the top of the stairs and I came in like didn't know it, that she was going to be there and I was just like oh I remember this lassie she's amazing um, and she was stood at the top of the stairs at the cat house as you come up where the, the, the cash desk is so I'm blathering away and she's just had this Alice like portrait finished in her arm and I was like, that is amazing. Like, who did that? She was just pure one word answer, man, like no having any of it. And um, <laughs> so we came up, obviously we were on the headline, it was glamour, so we played, but it was a sellout and there wasn't really anybody there to see Glamour the Kill. So when we finished playing, everybody kind of started to move away. Debbie had been standing at the side of the stage, so she was watching, but I knew there wasn't really anything happening there. So we'd... That was a 38 date tour. There was there was over a month just in the UK. We didn't get to Europe. It was like every so was that one of the first one of the first, first tours. Ones. Aye, it was like well, the Glasgow date was that one of the first. No, the it, it wasn't. I think we've been on tour since sort of mid March, and this was maybe like sort of was it in March that that gig was. Yeah. And mm. um, I got to Cardiff. We were back down there for another date, and. Uh, I tried to send Debbie a message, but obviously like, I'm a million years behind everybody else on social media and all that. And then I tried to send her a MySpace message. Because that was the, the, old, the old fail-safe MySpace, right? Oh, dear, and, oh, uh, and I didn't get a reply and I was just like, oh, well, it's gone, it doesn't matter. Life goes on. And the next minute I got a message back through saying, hey, don't check this much anymore. Nobody uses MySpace anymore. Everybody's got this Facebook, right? So I did. I made myself a Facebook just to go on there, just so right. I could talk to us. So eventually, we ended up blathering away. Going back in time, aren't we? honestly, no. mate. Back to think about a time before Facebook. It's quite incredible. So we end up messaging each other, and then I had two or three days off, and I was like, I come and pick you up when I'm back up the road. And we did. We went out on our, our first date and cast a motor. Somebody ran into the back. <laughs> Mate, I could have taken them for a whiplash claim, but I thought, I don't know how this is going to go and I didn't want to be tied into a... Like, <laughs> like having he to... Said, like, by the way, all right, me me it? Mind, uh, remember <laughs> me, we went out on a date once and somebody ran into the back as well, we're due a compensation. But I didn't, want to, I didn't know whether I was going to be able to like, keep it going or whatever. Um, you so, just split it, mate. But that was that, right? <laughs> so uh, we went out for a date and... Uh, <laughs> Well, it, as soon as Debbie leaned in for the first winch. Oh, I did not. That was it. <laughs> he wishes. You said that's for day one, mate. He wishes. <laughs> he, can, he can test too much, I think. Nah, she did. She, a wee heed come up, look. I right. <laughs> like that. And then that was it. So here we are, and it's like, <laughs> well, five and a half years married, and like, things are, we're in a good place. The hip's done, the painkillers are next. And then we'll just take it each day as it comes. Oh, okay, so, excellent. Cool, man. No, I always, I, I never forget the day. I think we, we got together actually uh, hanging out one day. I think it was just in town. I think we were having a couple of beers. And um, I think you said, ah, just like, you know, what's been happening here? And you're like, oh, I've just been offered the Yashin gig. And I think you just said to me, he's like, ah, I'm, I'll give you a year and I'll see how it pans out. And if Eight no, years, mate. And I'll I can't believe that and was 2009, by the way. Aye, and, 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 and I was like, magic, go for it. And that was one thing I always admired was the the almost a leap of faith because I think at that time you know I everybody that was into music would always love a kind of opportunity to do that but you'd always be shiting it thinking oh what the fuck I've got nothing to fall back on I've not got money I've not got a job and do you know what I mean and fair play to you as you say like fucking what was it ten years later aye but it was two thousand and eight to two thousand and sixteen so. Eight years with the band. Sorry, um, Debbie, don't make it quiet. Where are you going? Aye, there's a camera there. It's, see, we can see you sneaking out. <laughs> She's like, I fucking heard this story. Aye, yeah. <laughs> 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 fucking yeah, she did. <laughs> She's like, that fucking band, honestly. <laughs> Bane of my life. Oh, dear, oh, dear. But um, I, it, it was probably, because I was in a good job at the time, mate. Aye. Um, I was in decent money. I had my own flat. Um and it was strange because like people that I'd surrounded myself with, like people, like people that I'd been pals with for years were just like, 
what are you doing? Like they were all starting to settle down, like they were getting married and they had wains yeah. and stuff like that, and they had they had mortgages and whatever. And I was just like, I felt like after life blind and all that, like back when we were all like kind of doing the circuits, I still had unfinished business there, and like, I still had something to give. Like I still wanted to write songs, I wanted to yeah. to play gigs, and when the opportunity to come up to actually become involved with something that was already established. That was because it's kind it, of a no-brainer. Really. It was, mate. Because like, yep. they 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 auditioned. I don't know how many people came to audition, but um, obviously, me and Harry got the gig, and uh, it was like straight out to Europe. And when I think back on it, like that was amazing because it was well, it was Italy for five shows, brilliant. and it was like, but it was brilliant at the time because I thought, no way, I can't believe this. My first tour, like I'm going to tour Europe. But really, yeah. what Paul was trying to do was put us on in shows as far away as humanly possible from the UK where the band was established to find out what we were like. It's a good shout out, actually. Yeah. And if we were shite, they would just have papped us out as soon as we get half the fucking boat at Cali. But it worked out. And That's obviously cool, that... Like, mate, I'd, I'd, if that was me in today's... I would take that fucking opportunity you would take now. I, even, definitely. Like... You've got to take totally chances. Right. I course. just don't see the point in bypassing opportunities. If, if somebody yeah. really, like you're saying about settling down in families and stuff, we've always lived by the thing of, if you truly love somebody, that's not going to go away. You mm, know? 100%, and yeah. If, you, if your love for somebody is so fragile that they can't take an opportunity, then what's the fucking point? You I, know? I actually always remember a post you'd put up. It's Good wee while ago, actually. In fact, I think it was just when you you hung your mic up or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, you'd basically posted that how love love will kind of always always find a way. Like yep. I was kind of happy to like have do his thing and that. Which even even when I was like in a wee band, we done like wee tours. My missus is that I was always out with. Um, they always struggled with that and they just didn't like it and I was yeah. like that's, he's got himself a good lassie there that's that's cool yeah. and you were talking about how you were going on and he was supporting you and that and I was just yeah. like that's dead it's a dead good relationship you sort of got there I think I mean? always got it you know um, I was always obviously I'd never toured with performing at this point but I was a performer I knew what it was like and I knew what it was like to be bogged down by that jealousy and that and I always said to Kevin like you've got your life together if you're going to be together forever for the rest of your life to be together you know like you're only young once and Yo. you've got to go for it you know <laughs> every you opportunity Yo. <laughs> yeah I fuck it let's bring it back live, live your best life mate <laughs> live, live, <laughs> laugh, live laugh love baby <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right Lou still says that to me to this what, day YOLO YOLO, YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but she'll happily say listen if you get the itch and you do get it. the opportunity to go on the road do it and that's even with us, we Riley and stuff like that and all that kind of As long as you don't get the itch on the road, mate. I don't want to get the itch on the road. I don't want to get the itch at home either, to be yeah. fair. No. True. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, even if you did, your wee man will think you're cool as fuck, so that's amazing, you know. <laughs> that's the plan. Long well, mate, continue. I kept a lot of stuff, mate. Like I've, I've still got like, all my, my laminates, my tour passes and stuff like that. That's cool. Andy, when I turned 30, Andy McShane unbeknownst to me took got Debbie to take off I've got I had a shoebox with all my stuff in it and uh, he put it in like a Perspex frame for me so it's on the wall up the stairs and That's cool. although I'm convinced he stole a couple that he didn't have he definitely stole ah, a couple there was a, there was a Papa Roach <laughs> triple A that's went fucking missing Get me. And it was oh, definite. Uh, he was like, got, got, me. <laughs> <laughs> and he whipped shiny. It. You're a fucking it shiny. It was a fucking shiny as well. <clears throat> but um, I, I think everybody knew what it meant to me. And, like, even then, like, I, I think for Debbie, it was easy because she was just like, if that was me, I'd be going to do it. But yeah. for my family, it was a decision that they wouldn't have taken lightly. And for my mum and dad, at the age I was at the time, I think I was 24. Mm. Was I 24? You were 24 when you did join When I joined the band. I... So at that stage of my life, like when I think about where my dad was at 24, yeah, I would have been born and my brother would have been Shame no far Shame. off. And it's a totally different, you know, it's a totally different generation. But it, he was just like, going, what do you need for me? Like, mm. go, and do, go and do what you need to do. And, and when I think back to like, when we, we started to get serious and we, we were talking about getting a new van and stuff like that, like my dad being in the motor trade was like, I've got a van for you and don't be don't be fucking about with all the ex-postal vans and stuff like that. This is what you want. You want the 
the Mercedes Sprinter extra long wheelbase with this engine <laughs> yeah. and stuff and I was like dad we can't afford that he's like ah, you need to afford it he's like what's the most important instrument a band's got and I was like oh well I'm talking about Me. fucking <laughs> guitar amps and fucking this mic and he's like no the van because if you've not got the van you can't get to the fucking gig and need to hear you in the first place <laughs> so true, he yeah. ended up we got us this it was through a pal of his that we ended up with this van and we'd done 120,000 miles in it in four years mate oh my god like just ridiculous so just going back to his life in the Waltons man innit <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect that I honestly, honestly <laughs> big shout out <laughs> <laughs> mate, mate my dad's my hero honestly no he sounds, your dad sounds is a legend, legend. Eh? he's Aye. an absolute legend he's amazing he's my hero so, um, so I, he was just I, Big, I, big Stewart, I, Stewart, I, he was the just, legend He was just uh, So supportive of it And he would tell you If a tune was shite And he would tell you Because okay. obviously It was like It was heavy music yeah. And it wasn't his scene But He would have liked it I thought he was in a position To actually say I can Pick the bits that I like Out of that right. tune And he would tell you Whether something was garbage and That's yeah. cool so, isn't it? Um, I, I mean I actually thought One of the The, the best tunes you guys wrote was probably I don't know if it was maybe one of the tunes you wrote and it was off that uh, monster album was the, the final track on it the one I believe you sang on is that yeah. right oh uh, um, yeah. off the renegade circle the sun yeah aye it was circle That's it was the, the last track circle the sun yeah I yeah. thought that was correct I thought it was probably it's a beautiful the, song. actually the most mature track that you've written but the rest of them was just kind of like got that rocky kind of yeah. fun vibe a little bit you know what I mean got mm-hmm. the heavy the clean blah 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 yep. that kind of stuff. Um, but that one was really, really cool. I that think one, that one always stuck with me. Mate, tell you a funny story. I didn't know it was you that sang on it. Oh, until, did you not? Uh, I did. It was on. the robot voice. Uh, she was like uh-huh. a bender for future Anna. <laughs> 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 but um, I, I, I remember <clears throat> sitting in my flat one night and um, Paul's dad's got a MIDI guitar, right? Retro as fuck. So Paul says, I'm sitting fucking about with a guitar one night and it's broke and the only sound he can get out of it is a church organ. <laughs> so he said he sat playing this MIDI guitar and he sends me an audio clip of this piece of music and the hairs just stood up in the back of my neck mate I was like Paul that is outstanding he's like I want you to play it on the piano and it had that sort of um, architect's hollow crown sort of like vibe off it at the time the way it had it with the church organ he's like I don't want it played in a church organ I want it played in a piano I want you to learn it so I started programming it on the piano and um, we are supposed to be working on vocals for it and I was a real badger for leaving things to the last minute. Like I was never ever like, prepared for anything. And he was like, I want everybody to come down to green up for a songwriter. And we were just like mm. sitting Paul's Paul's flat and uh, and just sitting like jam out ideas and stuff like that. And the vocals for that tune I wrote in the car on the way from East Kilbride to Greenock. So it took 40 minutes to write the full tune. And, and that was it done. Like and then he had the idea for this like circle the sun, we love, we hate. Like right. just kind of, and that was like he wanted this, like sort of vocoder, like sort of voice in the background, and we ended up bringing Debbie into the studio to just like be a lassie voice and and record those bits for yeah, us. But I, I, I think originally you were thinking about a female vocalist, and I was playing about with it with you, and it was kind of like, why don't you just come in and do it? Aye. It worked out. It was fun. So That's cool. That to be able to join him in that oh, fun as well. It was Aye. experience it. This is always the mention, you know, hanging up the mic. You've done with it. You know, get the, you know, get the, you know, un, let's just say, I think you mentioned before, unfinished business. Aye. Is that the way you feel like that? Well, way? do you know what, mate? I think I achieved everything that I set out to achieve. For me, like, I played with all the You've bands that I grew cool up with, shit, the posters on my I wall. I mean, Lunt you know Biscuit I mean? singing yep. Just Like This was a Aye. fucking... If you've not seen that, but, check uh, it out on YouTube. Check that out on YouTube. Great video. Aye, that was in Amsterdam and it was just, amazing. that was like... I could have just chucked it after that. Like I felt like I'd done everything I wanted to do. And how, for go and tell like, folk uh, how uh, they can find that. <clears throat> and I how just, that came about, because but, but am I right in saying that they didn't have that in the set that night? It no. wasn't in the set. They don't do it live. No. They were, they um, do it live. When we were out, there was like a set of maybe like half a dozen, it was basically arena shows with Limp Biscuit. We played in Brixton Academy, main support Limp Biscuit, and their agent basically got in touch with Duncan and said, I quite like the sound of this band. Like, do they want the rest of the dates on this tour? Because Biscuit with it, people aren't there to see whoever's supporting Limp Biscuit. They're there to see Limp Biscuit. If Limp Biscuit mm-hmm. didn't have support bands, it wouldn't have impacted on their ticket sales in any in any way, shape, or form. They'd just have been there. So there wasn't any skin off their nose, and we got the rest of the dates on that tour. So we got to know them pretty well over the piece. Um, and we get to Amsterdam. Was it? I think it was meant to be a Heineken Music Hall, and we ended up 
the venue got changed to what was it called again? It was on the canal anyway. And um we'd played a big open air festival with them in Hamburg and they were sound checking and Div Grimison that used to do Psychodalic was there. Obviously he became quite pally with Fred Durst. Um and so that's through Xbox or something? Through like Xbox, that? that was a fucking mad story. <laughs> and um he was there and they were kind of like having a bit of pattern on that and talking about like, oh play this tune, play this tune. And uh I asked for just like this. It was my favourite tune, like off significant other, like the first track. It was probably the one that I, I probably missed the boat with three dollar bill, y'all. But when significant other came out, it was like after the intro, it was just the drums coming in, and I fucking <coughs> loved everything yep. about that it. That's a banger, man. And um, <coughs> they played it in soundcheck in Hamburg, but didn't go into the set. And then we were in the dressing room, and I got shouted through, and uh, he was like, "We're going to play just like this tonight." And uh, I want you to sing it. So I was like, no fucking way, man. Like, this is going to be like, so I was pure like sitting in the dressing room, like, had it in my headphones. Like, obviously knew it word to word, but we started to panic. Myself, like, I pure panicking. <laughs> so we were stood at the side of the stage and our, his stage manager had come up and he was like, you need to be waiting here. And uh, he came over and he just handed me the microphone and he went, it's all yours. Like, I thought he was going to like do it with me, but he just literally left, like, left me to do it. Like, fronted Limp Biscuit for three and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that's literally unreal it was nuts, amazing it? it was so, amazing to watch aye, it was imagine just, you fucking shat the lyrics up imagine well the, you, couldn't, you couldn't like. you, you couldn't shat the lyrics up because see what just you like what, piss. see what you think <laughs> are, are wedges aye. there's a screen aye. like the old man monitor so, oh, okay. with all the words on it think yeah. how many tu- wow. many tunes they've got yep. and he's obviously getting to that age now where he's so do they just do that They've got lyrics on a scroll and yeah. monitor. See, I thought that's all right for like a Springsteen or somebody like that, Tom Petty or something, but man, fucking hell. I know. Fred Springsteen Durst. does Aye. like a three or that's, set. That's like, <laughs> Fred Durst, that's a bit lazy, isn't it? That's lazy. Oh. Aye. But, um, Imagine, was, watch, but you know, watch your own lyrics come up on the screen and think, oh, fuck. You know, did hot, I actually write them? Aye, <laughs> chocolate starfish and <laughs> the fucking <laughs> hot dog flavoured fucking water. <laughs> but, um, That's, that is a cool, it's such a good video as well. Aye, it aye. was amazing. I, I loved it. There's a, I think uh, Paul Carr was there at the time as well and he took a video of it like for the side of the stage so you can see the crowd and everything there. Um, but it was just unbelievable, mate. I just... Once we done we that was when we were touring we Limp Biscuit we just released we created a monster and we were literally we played Download Festival and we went out was it Blackville Brides yeah. the tour Blackville Brides had just that was another story as well like they kind of Blackville Brides had came over to the UK and they were on tour with Murder Dolls so they were main support to Murder Dolls and then they immediately booked a headline tour to come back like three or four months later but playing all the same venues as Murder Dolls had played. So it was like ABC, Nottingham Rock City. Um, Cracking venues. Like between 1,000 and 2,000 mm-hmm. cap rooms all over the UK. And uh, their booking agent gets in touch with, with Duncan and says, we want Yashin to be main supporter on this tour. And, and he was like to me, Kev, what do you think of this, this tour? And Paul's already been on the phone to me already. And he's like, Kev, we're no day in it. They're talking about damaging the band's reputation to go out with like, basically like a, a scene band. Like, and I was like, Paul you're talking about like exposing the band mm. to a whole another audience like the, 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 the people next that buy like 40 of... and 50 quid mm. worth of merch every yeah. night like you, you, how are we going to pass this up and he's like Kev I'm telling you right now this is a big mistake this is set to fail this band have booked no no band comes over and supports a band and then books the same size of venues to go out and do their headline tour it's just it's not on and they came back to us and whatever it was they offered us we went right if you give us and we asked for more money on top of it and if they say no then fuck it we've not really lost anything right. and they came back and they accepted it so the minute after we've accepted it it seemed obviously it's it kind of manifested over a period of time but it seemed like just after we announced Blackveil Brides got the front cover of Kerrang and their video was all over the telly and everybody was talking about them all over social media and the next minute the ABC sold out fucking uh, amazing uh, all, uh, it was literally everywhere Manchester Academy 1 sold out and all these venues started selling out and then My Passion got announced as opener so it was a three band bill and then we got offered the European dates and it just seemed to just snowball just it was <clears throat> so was that initial thing do you reckon that initial thing was like you know they're coming back so soon to the same venues yeah. let's get the band to fill out our ticket sales do you think they were worried about yes, that in the yes absolutely they wanted yeah. us they, to pad it they out they the big time yep. and then mm-hmm. That's brilliant, so, man. Mm-hmm. But when, when we done that, it was, the, they played Download Festival and they had 
the full fucking like the backdrops basically at the side of the main stage the big electric like electronic advertising Aye. boards and it was black veil bride set the world on fire plus special guest yashin and it was just there Super like there's odd. what ninety thousand people at download yeah. festival every year and her name was just there and it was like what did we do there was label interest at the time and stuff like that and we decided we were going to do a self-release so we done the pledge music thing yeah and then uh it just kind of kicked on from there and we always thought like somebody would have come in like a major and they did and I think at that point it was just like you mate, sort of start to a wee bit scunnered by then already we were though, fucking scunnered that's man. a good like, question actually I mean it's sad that's when they came what in is, uh, what I, I would like to actually you know what happened with the Renegades album what happened with that major label deal what was the factors in it I mean was that just a band decision was that was that something to do with what the record label wanted or was it something to do with the sales of the album all that kind of stuff can you put that into context after that album get released what happened to the band aye so after we finished the cycle of We Created a Monster We Created a Monster came out in 2012 and the song which was the title track for the Renegades was written at the tail end of 2012 right okay. so we had the guts of the album Ready to Rock and Roll demoed by mid-2013 and the album didn't get released until March 2000 and was it March 2016 or 2015? They basically left us three years with the shell of the album and we went, we'd been up recording um, up in Aberdeen um, had a fallen out with the producer up there got all the stems of the tracks, put on it a hard drive and sent them down to Joe and Sam at Inner Sound Studios who had done an incredible job with them and got yep. them to the point where we were starting to like option it out to different labels yep. and we got this bite from Sony Columbia that they were possibly interested in releasing the album in Central Europe, UK, putting out in Asia and stuff like that as well. So we thought this could be huge. We could have put it out ourselves when it was, but I think we just lost a lot of momentum. Like, yeah. And by the time it was like ready to come around, they were like starting to second guess the size of the band and, and our pool. Um, and they put us out on like a couple of sort of headline shows, Glasgow, London, Manchester, sold the three of them out. And then we went back into the studio again to finish the album and they basically sent us all this stuff that they wanted done with the tunes. And it really was like, that you talk about sell your soul to the devil. It was like, mm -hmm. this song's too long. Cut this bit out. Put another chorus in there. We don't want this bridge in here. We don't want that outro. Like, yep. and this, we wrote songs for live. We wrote tunes to get a reaction mm -hmm. out of the crowd and stuff like that. And we just felt like they came in and just sapped all the, all the energy yeah. out of the album completely. Just everything you hear about major labels, basically. Yeah. I, I was, <clears> totally. Exactly, mate. That was it. Um, when, when we went to see that Queen film, I actually felt really familiar. See that scene where... Green Room Rhapsody came Myers. out and they they tear it a new one yeah I felt like that was so familiar because I remember all that happening to their album and me just being like fuck off like you're taking you've took what is a tune and the integrity of it and just mate see, we, see when like, see when they were talking to us in the first place they were literally like uh, the size the magnitude of what they were putting forward to us is a carrot to bring the record out through them was like, oh, we want to put you out on tour with Le not Limp Biscuit, with Lincoln Park. They're going to be doing an album release over here and stuff like that. And it was like, fucking hell. Like, and that's the dream. Weird that's I mean, how, so how can perfect. you even question that? That was it. And, and what we needed thing? at the time, because we've been away for so long, <clears> was a complete rebranding of the band, like a total resurgence. Mm. Yep. Like, basically putting ourselves out there as a new product to people who'd never heard of us yeah. before because... Yashin always had a shelf life because because of the type of music that we wrote and the type of people that were listening to our tunes, they weren't going to stick around forever. Like you weren't going to have somebody that was like because of the the fan base <laughs> that we built up through Black Veil Brides tour, going out with red jumpsuit apparatus. Like they were teenagers mm -hmm. who move on very quickly. So yeah, quickly. you kind of need to bounce it's teenage straight. Height. You need to just teenage height. Do it right away. I mean, like bands like I can't believe bands like All Time Low, like you were talking about earlier on. Every band that we toured with chucked it because they just 
ran out of steam. The blackout, kids in glass houses, um, just uh, who else was there back in the day? Canterbury, um, We Are the Ocean. Like these bands yeah. all just chucked it. I mean, Lost um, Profits chucked it for a different reason. <laughs> <laughs> aye, they certainly did, mate. But aye, I just, by the time it got to, they wanted to put us out for the headline tour to release the Renegades. They were talking about putting us out in a joint headliner with a band called Vampires Everywhere who were coming over from America. They booked the venues and we saw the sales at the start of the, like, when they first came out and it was like, this isn't where they, these should be. What do you want to do? We meant to be going out in Europe and all that. I just started a job. And at that moment in time, I couldn't think of anything worse than being in the back of the van mm. with the boys thinking about how many people are going to be at the shows and yeah, what we'll be doing. It. Mate, it was stress. <clears throat> and, and gone were the days, as I said, when I joined Josh and I was 24, and I would have jumped into the back of a van for six cans of lager and 20 John Player special yeah. and just wouldn't have cared about what was there. But as the band progressed, Andy's became a dad. Like, I'm married. Dave's married. Like, ever, Connor was like the, the young blood in the band and he was the only one that seemed to want to drive it forward. Everybody else was just scunnered with it. And we all just came to a decision that we were going to cancel the headline tour and book two shows, London and Glasgow, and just go out on a high. And we played two sold out shows, and that was it. Done and dusted. It must have been tough so, though. Mate, it was hard. I was fucking emotional see the last couple mm. of gigs. Um it was hard, but I definitely think we made the right decision. And see that thought process of I can't think anything worse than being in the back of a van. Like that's still that tells you. it's still there, mate. Like mm -hmm. I'll I'll continue to write tunes in whatever capacity but the idea of being back out on tour again I just can't think of it and worse like I love my house I love my job I love my yeah. wife I love my motor mm. like, I just can't think of it and worse than being back out on tour again I think you can see that from a I mean I, we got a, a rock band in last year and it had one of the guys I spoke to from it was was Billy Sheehan who plays with Mr Big who plays with various other bands and play, played with Sons of Apollo who played at Motherwell and uh, that's exactly the scenario. So if they didn't have the luxurious tour bus and they all have a dressing yeah. room each, and I can mind saying to him, I was like, oh, how's this tour been? And the way he said it, he's like that. I've been on tour since February. You know, I was on tour with Mr Big straight through for months and then straight on tour with this. He's like that. He just looked scunnered and he basically was saying, he's like, it's hard. He's like, they might see us for two hours a night, but that's the only two hours that are the good two hours in the day yeah. uh, do you know what I mean Kevin used to say that to me a lot he said the only time tour's good is that one hour on one stage and I hate the rest and <coughs> it's such a weird perception people that aren't in creative industries they have an idea of what it's like like oh the tour bus the glamour the this the that and the reality is completely different yeah. you know it's completely different for people well um, he here's the thing right you talk about Debbie's social media <coughs> and she's honest as a day's long like whatever her day was that day you get an account of exactly what went on that day. You get her sitting on the couch, unable to move. I've got no motivation whatsoever. Here I am. Or you get the complete opposite of it. Like, here we are. Uh, we're, we're at the airport. We're, we're about to fly out. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, I've got a big Bands show. Blah, blah, blah. only give you what you want to see. Yeah. So they when I'm stuck in the, the, the back of a Mercedes Sprinter, looking out a window, like that size. <laughs> see, when I think about the places that I went, like... We were everywhere, mate. We went, we were Scandinavia, Central Europe, um, Italy, Germany, France, like literally all over the place. And I didn't see anywhere. No. Like, it's weird, isn't it? You're I just literally going anywhere. in there. Like, literally, we get to a venue, you would sit about <coughs> eating fucking Doritos and like just shite. It's you like the Truman Show, it's like you're not actually there. No, no. And you would play and then you got that, oh, we're in fucking, we're in, in Switzerland. Like, this is amazing. Like, look. Like, well, actually, um, bus calls in 40 minutes because you need to drive to fucking Copenhagen for the gig tomorrow. Like, people don't think about stuff like that. So, yeah. it, like, it's interesting. It's amazing. You know, talking to, a, you know, another musician as well in a similar kind of scenario, you must have had like a, that whole stage persona where you come off stage and probably the only thing you've done, you've scunnered after and just want to go and chill out, probably on your own. But you'll be inundated to be uh, fans coming up want you to be their best pal or sign this or sign that or speak to me or speak to me do you know what I mean and you know 
when I spoke to uh, this other musician, he's like that. Oh, I've got this persona on stage. I wish I knew who that guy was because <laughs> oh, that's, that's not so me. True. Do you know what I mean? He's like, but I need to put that hat on. Yeah, for Mate, that I, whole time, I, regardless I of how I'm feeling. Yeah, I, I can see where somebody know? would get that feeling, but I was nothing but grateful for the people that came to see us. Like. I just remember them sitting outside in like fucking thermal blankets like they were ready yeah. to fucking honestly man Long see, John's like the big man <laughs> see, see, see cunts like Bear Grylls and stuff like that fucking scaling Mount Everest and stuff like that Bear Grylls has got fuck all on a wee lassie outside a venue <laughs> in minus six <laughs> sitting outside true. Manchester Academy with a thermal blanket yep. on because she's waiting to see fucking Hawthorne Heights it's or so something true. like that like, so that true. is dedication right I remember being in Prague and it I think it was Prague anyway and uh, Hawthorne Heights were playing and talk about like bands that are just scunnered with it they had a big album maybe around about 2003 or something like that right, right. it done well big tune dance floor filler you're like who the fucking Hawthorne Heights no I, remember, I actually remember, <laughs> I remember, I remember them. Them. that's Bruce's vintage that kind of band <laughs> and uh, this must have been 2010 2011 and we were in Prague and it was shit sales we'd been fucking tacked on like we had a date missing on the tour and the, the promoter booked us in for this show and um, they were all sitting backstage on their laptops like Skyping their wives and their kids and stuff like that and they knew that they were going out to play to like 160 people or something like that and I remember just going in and going like that oh, I never want to be that cunt um, that's fucking awful like when you're that when you're that band you're just fucking clinging on to false hope at that stage. They were never going to emulate the success that they had. No. Yeah, you need, you need to leave for that. Yeah. You need Absolutely. to fucking just have a clean break. You want to leave with a bit of dignity, you know? Yeah. Right. And then the most important thing at that stage was to maintain relationships with the boys that were in the band because it was getting fucking toxic. Yeah. And we're still pals. Yeah. So we'll still meet up. We do a fucking a Christmas night out in like February or March every year. <laughs> Um, and we all have a meet up and we'll talk and tell fucking funny stories about things that happened when we were away and it's it's a good place to be and everybody is doing all right so um, and there was time there was a time when that. nunnies wanted to be around each other and that was horrible and for boys it became like brothers to me the lot of them like it was hard to watch mm -hmm. mm. it go from happy to yeah. just the atmosphere was terrible and it's nice to see he's now being friends because you, you can't, I, I mean, I'm not being in a band, but from being there, like, I don't think you can break the bond of being with bandmates for that long, you know? Like, you've been through a lot of shit together. Mm -hmm. You pretty much slept with each other, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, totally. Mate, There's we literally, totally. like, in the first van, the van that my dad recommended us, came as a minibus <laughs> and we ripped all the seats out it and built, like, a bunk sort of area in the back, right? But I remember being away and, like, oh, fucking hell, man. That first ever tour in Italy... The height of summer, it was roasting. So you can imagine you get places, it's Very fucking true. freezing at night time, but you wake up in the morning, it's absolutely melting. So you're like driving through the Alps, like think about it, like just like a fucking Toblerone advert in the background and you're sitting <laughs> in this Sprinter van with half a dozen guys that you've not really spent any length of time with. Um, you get into bed, and the condensation inside the van, the fucking smell, it's just absolutely hoaching. If you're licking it after Wendy's. Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm lying there and I'm just like, like, what the fuck is that? And it was just condensation, like pure dripping down and like landing onto my head. And it was <laughs> it was brutal, man. You're like, you'd wake up and like David would be sitting up the front of the van, like the van's getting the air conditioning, but he's sitting with the pure, <laughs> the cold fans blowing hot air through on his face and trying to get there. So we pulls up at this service station uh, in Italy somewhere just coming out of the, coming out of Switzerland the San Bernardino Tunnel so it's like fucking picturesque and you've pulled into this wee bit in Italy and it's a service station and we've been spanking Jägermeister and eating like Euro burgers for like McDonald's and that all, the whole <laughs> way there and I'm bursting for a shite so I get suited at the service station and goes up to the door <laughs> And the fucking it's an automatic door not no open the place is dubbed and I'm just like I fucking can't handle this I come back and I'm sitting in the van mate the sweat's pouring off me <laughs> and I was like what am I going to do and I was like I can't fucking sit here that place will no open for like another three or four hours so I looks up and there was like a sort of shelf that sat above the seats in the in the back of the van and there was a row of toilet roll up there and I was like yeah fucking beauty so I jumps out the van with this this toilet roll and I bounces down like 
there was it was a basically like a big like lorry park like everybody was all these long distance drivers were all sitting mm-hmm. there and uh, I pulls up like the passenger side of one of these HGVs and it's got the curtains drawn and all that on it and um, I just fucking dropped my kegs and <laughs> mate it was like a cow pat <laughs> like, it wasn't a defined shite it was just like this big mound of shite right <laughs> so it was actually en- it one. was actually encroaching on <laughs> my bum cheeks and I had to take a wee sort of hop and I skipped forward to get out of the road of the, and dropped a second pile right <laughs> So mm, I, I wiped my ass. This is not where I expected this to be going. I wiped, wiped my ass and I came back into the van, mate. I was just like, oh fuck. So I got sent in my sleeping bag and it felt like I'd been sleeping for a couple of minutes, but I woke up, it was light, and there was this guy outside the van, like going fucking nuts. And he was like, I could see him in the reflection of the window of the van, and he was over at the the, the service station, sort of bit. Over there's like a tap on the on the wall outside, and he was like cleaning these boots <laughs> <laughs> we all know who this so guy is let's like, face oh, it we all know no man you're fucking kidding me on so it dawned on me <laughs> that we were in Europe and the passenger side isn't the passenger side it's the driver's <laughs> side right so this guy had obviously bounced down out his cab in the middle of the night and landed in just a big fucking two piles of human shite <laughs> and fucking just left it could have Fuck passed it could have passed for like a big dog shite if it wasn't for the toilet roll they've been the most advanced dog in civilization <laughs> just like fucking but um, mate we had some brilliant times um, it was really stressful but <laughs> I love that that's the, the one of the times you tell us about uh-huh. <laughs> sounds like it mate uh-huh. well I it was just we wrote some brilliant tunes made really good memories met my wife and I've just kind of like pushed it to one aye, side I've done, done no bad from it aye, I'll, I'll never ever stop like being into music or writing tunes or but I just can't see myself like being in that sort of band situation again yeah. like, it's, it's a kind of young man's game isn't it I think so mate I think so it got to the point where like I just wanted to be on stage like with a pair of joggies and like a pair of Nike Air Max and just kind of like sitting with a cup of tea and <laughs> <laughs> just wish to be like that anyway. I don't think that's what the kids want to see. Eh? No, nah, mate. <clears throat> maybe sometime, maybe they will at some point. <laughs> and when that day comes, the <laughs> three of us are walking, <laughs> reform We're ready. the 2001 fucking powerhouse. <laughs> Slippers, <laughs> tea. Aye. Wing back chairs, we'll Chesterfields. We'll be fucking ready. Aye. Well, Nike, I mean, what's, what's next? Um, Is there a next? Or are we just playing it by ear at this stage? You know what I mean? Is that? No, Obviously but, Debbie's in recovery Let's, I mean how how long is your recovery expected to it's take? It's meant to be 12 weeks in total I'm meant to be 6 weeks on sticks But I'm feeling fine So I think I'll be quicker than that How long has that been <laughs> since? Is it 2.5 weeks? 3 weeks? Well 3 weeks tomorrow 3 weeks tomorrow yeah Right cool So yeah I can go back to tattooing in About 6 weeks and performing I'll wait till the 12th week for that But yeah, I'll be leading up to it. Right, she just needs to go and start getting the fucking wedge in, mate, because I'm cracked. <laughs> <laughs> Give your tattoo joint a wee, wee plug, actually. Oh, I Well, I work at the Comedian Tattoo, but I go under the name of Debbie Deluxe Tattoos. But Debbie is spelled D-E-B-A-Y, which confuses lots of people. <laughs> it's not D-B-A. D-B-A. <laughs> Americans tend to call her D-B-A. D-B-A, bid. English people call tattoo. me D-Bay as well but yeah that's where I work so come and check out my work and see me I think I you're know. missing a trick with your branding I think you should go for like a play on the eBay logo <laughs> no it's not cute enough D-Bay no as <laughs> soon as you get called that anyway I know I just accept it now it's fine <laughs> so it's it's you're called. still performing you're still modelling yeah a little bit um I do it when it comes up. I don't really chase it like I used to. I'm right. getting on a wee bit, you know, I'm a bit of a, a mature model. <laughs> but it goes hand in hand with the performing. You really need to keep yourself up to date with your profile in order to like keep yourself fresh for performing because people are always looking for new and current images. But the offset of that is as soon as you're doing new images, people are asking you to do work for yeah. them or whatever. But I do a lot more live modelling um, at events and things like that. So, and I so do some brand stuff as well. I work with brands. Just, it, yeah. well, it's more bloggy kind of side of things now. It's kind of changed that way. Like people more want you to blog their clothing company than yeah. come for a specific shoot. Mm-hmm. 
So, I mean, obviously, you, you, you've still been recovering for a while, but I mean, yeah. what, you know, you certainly put a little shout out for, I mean, where do you perform? Where can, we, where can people see you perform in the future and stuff? Well, where are you planning? Where um, have you done it in the past? Who have you modelled for in the past and stuff? Um, well, right now, I was with Club Noir, who were pretty established in the UK in general for a long time, but I've since went solo. But I'm now part of, there's a new night in Glasgow so, called Cirque de Mort. We've got a lot of amazing people on board with that. We will be touring. That's the main aim. So please look out for it, no matter where you're staying. But we have a show on the 23rd of March and we'll have shows coming up. That's a lot more, it's a lot more up my street. Kind of circus, bit more alternative, bit more yeah. weird. Um, generally, I just go wherever, wherever the bookings take me. <laughs> right. I like entertainment. Yeah, I do a night called Entertainment, which is pretty cool. My friend Chris runs that and he's brilliant and it's a mix of burlesque, comedy and magic. <clears throat> right. Which is a lovely combination. It takes me back. Years ago you used to get these great cabaret nights that were a mix of all these things. It doesn't happen as much, but it's a really good night, great atmosphere. I work with uh, Glasgow Fest for Burlesque. They do the midweek fling in Well Cabaret. Well Cabaret in general is a great place. Um, yeah, everywhere. As for modelling, I, I work with a brand called Mirror Image directly now. And you do a thing for Torture Garden tor- as well, I was going to say, my live modelling's mostly with Torture Garden. I actually run their models now. Right. Um, for people that don't know Torture Garden's uh, the biggest fetish night in the world <laughs> but it's not as scary as it sounds um, they're very cool um, very awesome so I get to work with them and they're amazing people um, it's seen me go down to London and stuff and Manchester and so yeah I'm around the UK Right so tell us you've obviously just kind of honed in on that there is this I don't know expectancy of what fetish fetish nights are people yeah. like maybe just go I don't I'm not into that I think like, it's like creepy and forceful yeah. maybe so I'm sure there'll be some folk lis- listening to this no really know what that means so what does it tell us what well obviously it is as plain as day um, a fetish night is geared up towards people who are interested in the BDSM community I'll help you mate um, you talk to carry on. Yeah, you get a <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Speak to the creepy guy. <laughs> <laughs> Leave the creeps together in the room. Uh, yeah, it's geared up towards people who do have an interest in BDSM on many different levels. A lot of people are really interested in like the fashion side of it, the clothing side, and a lot of people. I mean, you get people there that are they work in that industry and. Right. you get people there who want a taste of it like maybe someone would be interested in maybe trying a bit of BDSM but they're not really sure where to start so and what, I, is, what is BDSM let's go right back to basics <laughs> well okay I'll, I'll d- just generalise it like you're dumb it down for my mum she'll be listening <laughs> I know I'm just like oh god yeah it's just um, hold on are you going to ask Cindy to get into some BDSM yeah, well, I, I know, know. Cindy's I know. it's uh, well your bondage dominatrix say the mask has some bit of you know a bit of everything so if you want to try getting your arse spanked or a bit of tying up you can do that as well you can be as involved or not involved as you want to be so there are playrooms for people who want to try some stuff out and go and it's, I always say it's a wee bit cheaper than a dominatrix as well buying a ticket <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time there's also just your dance room your dance floor for people who just want to go and have a party and yeah where whatever their may, their fetish may be and it's yeah. really liberating for people I've met people from all walks of life like people you would never expect and everyone is lovely and the wrong perception of fetish nights is that there are sex parties which isn't true that sex doesn't happen at Torture Garden uh, that's kind of where I was wanting to, to yeah. go right and the other weird perception is that you'll be forced or you'll be made to feel uncomfortable that doesn't happen either and I actually think that they're stricter on their rules about how you react with people, how you interact. And I actually weirdly feel safer at a fetish club than I do a normal club. Right. Because at a fetish club, if a guy touches me or harasses me, it's dealt with immediately. Yeah. Whereas in a normal nightclub, it isn't. If a guy feels my arse, mm. no one exactly. cares. There's, there's, let's face no it, there's, cares. No, there's not really any strict rules at a no, normal I nightclub. No, I feel less safe in a normal know? nightclub. I look yeah. a certain way, I'm aware that I look a certain way and it does attract attention in a normal club. 
It's kind of sad that there has to be that no, rule in it. It's like I know, uh, I know, but in fetish clubs, they're very, very like consent is key. Yeah, and if you yeah. so much as did that, like you'd be barred for life from not just them, but word would spread in the fetish scene. And I think that's incredible, and I think it's something that should be widespread. And I think it's hilarious that there's such a weird perception of these nights, and yet they're probably safer and better for people. Yeah. Yeah, and that's funny. I think it, it, I think it's more open now than it's ever oh, been though, it, and it's that's a good. It's obviously oh, increasingly definitely. more so. People should be able to talk about these things. It's it's a weird thing for me. Um, I promote the fact that I'm sexually open. I talk about these things all the time, but for people it's really strange, and I, I think it's bizarre because it's something that everybody does. Yeah, but everyone's yeah. afraid to talk, talk about. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'll never understand why. But whereas Kevin, on the other hand, the opposite to me, like he's very traditional and that's fine, you know. And I, in the same breath, if someone doesn't want to talk about it, I'll, that's, that's fine, fine as well. That's equally as fine. But I don't believe in people being chastised for like what what they want to do and yeah. what they want to talk about. And these clubs allow people to feel like they're not a weirdo or a pervert. You know, they're not wrong for liking what they like. They'll meet other people that like what they like and and maybe not feel as isolated because I guess if you've got a particular interest and you're a very you're in a very square life for want of a better word, yeah. it it could make you feel like a bit of a weirdo when you shouldn't feel yeah. that way. You know, like you shouldn't feel that way. See, so, yeah, I think the way the world is tonight, there's obviously a lot of shit things happening. But one thing I've really noticed, especially over, well, I suppose since the kind of Me Too movement or whatever, yeah. um, women definitely celebrate, like, um, like say a few years ago, for example, if a lassie put up a, a picture on, I don't know, Twitter, yeah. Facebook, whatever it may be, um, and she was wearing a bit risky a sexually clothing, provocative picture. Yeah, lassies would be like slag, yeah. slut, like totally... Oh, totally. Body shames. Yep. But nowadays, I think lasses are very, it's really, oh, really it's switching. It's incredible. And I love it. I think it's amazing. Like, And I think the perception's changing. Years ago, people thought if you were like that, it was to attract men. And it's something that I battled against a lot because I've always kind of been the same type of person. Whereas now, I find women celebrating it and being like, yeah, you're making me feel like I can do that. And no offence, guys. I mean, I'm sure... It is nice to have attention if that's what you want, but it's not just for that. It's for you, you yeah. know, and it feels really good and it builds your confidence. And to see a girl, like, if a girl wants to pour her brilliant arse, good for her. Like, yeah. why shouldn't she? Like, you know, and I think it's a really exciting time for women. I, I think it's a brilliant yeah, time I've, for women. I've really like, noticed that, like, I mean, it was International Women's Day or yeah. two days ago or something, and see the amount of lassies that were posting... Stuff is like you would never pictures. have got that two oh, years totally. ago, or like you wouldn't get the comments as well no. of support from other girls. So that's that's obviously different. I, I hate the part of it's like uh, if a girl posts something like that, say it's of her ass or something like that, or she's posting herself in a some sexually provo- provocative fucking stance, and somebody went, Oh, well, she's posted that online, so she's she's opening herself up. Oh, yeah, the, like, fuck it, off. she's obviously it, wearing it. Uh, it's uh, like, uh, it's like rape, rape culture. Oh, no, it's, and that's, that's a line totally to victim blaming. You know, like that's she, a route to victim blaming. Yeah. She should almost welcome the negative no, comments. No, totally. Bollocks. Bollocks to that. The other it's thing I've bullshit. heard is um, you don't respect your partner if you do that. No one respects their husband like I respect my husband and he respects me. So to say that me enjoying who I am as a, a younger woman is bullshit. You know, you can respect yourself and respect your partner without it being defined by what bit of clothing you're wearing. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, totally. But it's changing and I'm really, really happy. It's weird because you touched on the negative comments thing and that's changed with it, I would say. Yeah. Like you're saying, the type of girls now that are leaving amazing comments probably wouldn't have done that five years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, they would have just went, you just want attention, <laughs> you know. Yeah, there was probably an element of... I wish I could do that without... Oh, definitely. So yeah. Definitely. But now it's okay and I think it's wonderful. I think it's a lovely thing. Um, yeah, and I encourage everyone to try it. <laughs> All girls. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> as long as we, I don't have to start doing that. Man. Aye, get your Nobody wants to see that. Lucy, man. get your tits out for everyone. <laughs> either either re- reprise the, the silver jumpsuit. Mate, I think I've the got a silver Get the hot, where's your hot pants? It's <laughs> Because to be fair, like the, uh, silver, the silver spandex would probably be peeling a, me out of it. accepted at Torture Garden. Yeah. Or um, yeah. Get Maybe the that's lo- where I, I belong. Get the long johns mm. out in an hard glass table. <laughs> I, I don't suppose I would ever find myself at Torture Garden but I've never ever have a problem with Debbie going there. Like some of the, but I think my perception of it before I met Debbie would have been like fucking creepy weirdos. <laughs> well, that's that's just, a, that's, that's the general it's, it's because you were in the Waltons, mate. Like, yeah, absolutely. No, but that's uh, that was actually when I asked I you. Bet. How did you Can do I that Kevin? when you first got? <laughs> Can I Craig? <laughs> Can I Pa? <laughs> he he wets the bed, <laughs> and then uh, he got his arse spanked, and it was all history. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I would never ever stop Debbie going there. I think, like the folk that I've met, that Debbie's like photographers and stuff like that. For Debbie was doing a photo shoot in the bathroom about how long? About just eight weeks ago, or something like that, just after yeah. New Year. Mm-hmm. And um, the big photographer guy that came in was just the soundest guy. Like he obviously does all the photography for these like fetish events yeah. and stuff like that. And you look at his pictures, and they're wild. They're they are they're ridiculous, mate. They're provocative. They're wild, and. Uh, he does all these, the photography for the like, torture garden and stuff like that. But can he I literally just sat beside. Pause you for a second. Can I shout him out because he's amazing. Ah, he's class. Go look at his pictures. His name is Pictures in Blood on all social media, and he is incredible. It's artistic. It's beautiful. And always, and everybody wants to go and look at pictures in blood. Like, <laughs> that's, that's your thing. Then it, it was a sound. Mate, he sat. He sat where you're sitting, and we had a. A brilliant conversation just about. Did he sit here? He sat exactly there, mate. Aye. Right there. In that, <laughs> very seat. Right there. in that very seat. And uh, so honoured. Aye. And it, we just <sighs> we spoke about music. And uh, I think what you need to remember is they're just normal folk at the end of the day. Like, there are people who have got a 95 and they've got the outlet and that's their, their thing. Yeah. I remember we, obviously, Club Noir was mild compared to Torture Garden and stuff like that. But uh, I remember I met. A woman that used to be like one of the top like coordinators for South Lancashire Council at Club Noir, and she was, was right? she was dressed up like the fucking Moulin Rouge, and she was affronted when she seen me because obviously I was there, like I think I had a suit on or something like that. But I was also there to see Debbie, and she was just like, <laughs> "What are you doing here?" <laughs> like that sort of, but like. Didn't matter, mm. like I didn't, mm. I didn't care. It wasn't like I was and they were going, boys, guess who I seen in the fucking club the other last night? <laughs> Did their pap suit? Like, wasn't it like that? But um, much like anything else as well, you became accustomed to it and that just shows you how perceptions can change. I remember mm-hmm. the first time you came into the changing room and you were like, girls were just talking to me with their tits out. And obviously for a lot of guys, that's like, oh my God, but you just get used to it. And now Kevin's like, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it just passes him back. <laughs> 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 I'm dead. He's wee face the first time. I don't think I'll ever I'm be unfazed by tits, man. <laughs> 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 but uh, the only downside is that like I could literally walk about and like suspenders and shit and Kevin would just be like ready for work dear <laughs> Aye De- De- Debbie will obviously like uh, she goes out to all these um, like shows and she do her performances and stuff like that so I'll see her like rehearsing her acts and um, I'll see her on stage and it, it's amazing and then um, but like there's no um there's no element of surprise like when you get up the road like if she's wearing the same gear that she's got on when she's on stage and stuff like that it's like aye that's it mm. but get her in a pair of joggies and a jumper <laughs> and I'm like it's on the night it's on did you just put <laughs> some joggies on man <laughs> 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 I'm dressed sexy for my man tonight <laughs> 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 put that on myself put get the noise boys at the house man see the grey Adidas joggies with pink stripes on them mate put that big Mickey Mouse t-shirt on <laughs> oh, that's funny man do you know what actually uh, seeing back to photographers though that's uh-huh. that's the one thing that I thought might be a bit dubious you must get uh, like you were saying that guy was the soundest guy in yeah. the world Aye. there must be the complete opposite oh, of the guys that are just getting into the photography game purely for the fact they're trying that's, to seduce young birds and, and uh, getting photos you, you really have to have initiative about you if you don't have an agent especially I had an agent years ago I've still got one in Manchester for performing but you really need to have your wits about you not all girls do they don't they get they see their name in lights they think I'm a model now I'm dead excited and I, I feel shite for them because it, it can be really daunting luckily I've always been a wee bit of a gamey so 
Yeah. I had that in my side from day one where I was very particular about who I worked with and why I was working with them. And But you can suss it. You can suss it by the messages. The The main one is which, so which are levels? And you tell them, yeah, but were you willing to go to? No. Nah. Like Ben, like Aye. you know, right away. Uh, Harvey Weinstein coming. Aye, there, totally. <laughs> but you get it all the time. And the other good thing is girls talk, and it's the lovely thing about social media is that um, we do, we can talk to each other now. We can interact, and there's actually pages on Facebook that are solely dedicated to watch out for this creep. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not definitely. Well um, so we can tell each other, and mm-hmm. that no girls get sucked in by it, especially new girls who don't know and want to want to try their hand at it and will get sucked in by these weirdos who leave them looking vulnerable and it's horrible so no I've never encountered it other than um, where I've cut it off pretty quickly aye you know and I've been yeah. lucky I've been very lucky that way but I do understand that it is a scary thing for girls but I would always say to anyone if you're ever in doubt take someone with you and see if a photographer Aye. doesn't want you to take someone with you then that's your alarm bells um, like I've, I've literally took my best friend and said she was my stylist Aye. like right. I have like, right, quite right especially if it was the first time I well it was actually the first time I went to a guy's house and he turned out he's an amazing photographer Tommy Cairns again I'll shout him out amazing boudoir photographer but I was quite early in my modelling career at this point and wasn't accustomed to just going to a guy's house in Ayrshire shit myself a wee bit I was like oh my god like so I just took my best pal to be like my, my stylist and that was and he had no problem with it of course he didn't he wasn't a creep and yeah. it protects him as well you know like yeah. there's two flip sides to this a guy's got to look after himself and the last thing a guy wants is a girl accusing them of mm-hmm. being yeah I was actually going to come in at that angle because like, being a photographer myself like I'd be very reluctant yeah, yeah, a bit scared. To do, I've had a couple of folks that have spoken to me about would you do this kind of shoot and and you're like, I'm not comfortable. I've been a bit like, oh man, I, 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 I'd panic in case yep. it just went tits up or whatever. Totally. Or like, I, I, I don't know. It's If I you know them, it's different, I think. But yeah, like, totally. you maybe need to get a name for yourself before right. you yep. can... I was well, wondering what size of feet like... you've got and stuff. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you know each other, like you might know my friend Neil Jarvie, yeah. photography. We've got, we're really good friends. We've got a close friendship. And I remember... When I worked in Club Noir, my boss there had seen his pictures of me. He does cool street style, very casual. Like he's, it's nothing like I would do with some other photographers. And she hired him to do a latex shoot with me and he was not comfortable with it. He came along, he'd done it. So I did see the other side of that where he was like, I'm really not into this. And um, and I respected him for that as well. I knew it wasn't really his bag and it's fine, but. Yeah, it's it's a hard one. It's a hard one, and bo- I can see it from both sides of you. Like I can, mm. I feel bad. As much as I feel bad for girls, I do feel bad for guys because it must be scary sometimes to be in that position where you don't want to intimidate a woman or make her feel uncomfortable or yeah. you know or cross her line, especially when you encroach on like your glamour style photographers. You know, they they, they must be very aware of the fact that. A girl could feel it's, vulnerable, you know. It's a I mean, funny time just now, you, I think. It is funny. Have you, you know, you said you've a couple of times that you've you've been approached by that. I mean, is that but it's, has it been has it's it, been folk I've kinda known, so right. yeah. I, I've not done it. Like Is that been um, a, is that been is a it, thing? Is it been like boudoir or glamour, if you don't mind me asking, or it, art nude or Aye, art nude. Art nude, right. Okay. Um, and I've just But that's a hard one, isn't it? Like Yeah, well, I mean I, I did kind of know them, but I, I kind of wasn't I mean I've the kind of photographer that I want to go down as well it's there is a very fine line of making it not keeping it kind of arty I yeah. suppose and whether my girlfriend would be sound with that and stuff as yeah, well so I'm totally. like I don't I don't think it's probably anywhere I'll ever go really uh-huh. but um was I, it I ever, know, a, just, ever a monetary thing I mean was that something that you'd, you'd have thought about for money wise because like, it's obviously a big market more girls are getting they're yeah. wanting pictures. They're wanting pictures, and they're getting more confident. Because they want to feel liberated. Yeah, especially oh, now. It's so a big thing. From a business thing, has that ever interested you? Did that? Yeah. Well, it kind of has, but uh, if it was ever going to cause me problems with the missus or that, like, right. cause yeah, you, absolutely. That's your other yeah, factor. Yeah, of there of or but um, I mean, I, I would be quite interested in doing like arty, yeah. like, not like pure kind of glamour. Nothing no, against I, it. It just, just doesn't interest me. Beautiful. Yeah. You need to watch what you're doing as well, mate, because obviously, like. 
If like say wedding photography is a big thing obviously it's a good pair in that as well like if somebody goes to look at your portfolio like yeah. all it would take is like a traditionalist to look at your portfolio what? and go ah, oh, oof I've not seen that he's happen he's taking with. pictures yeah. of lassies with their fucking three corner carpet I've, <laughs> not seen, <laughs> I've not seen that problem with art nude photographers well nobody bringing him up to Loch Lomond to take photos yeah. of the wedding yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's exactly it yeah. if he thinks he's what coming to, my wife today? <laughs> if he thinks he's coming to the Carrick Spa to yeah. take pictures at my wedding <laughs> He got an off like coming, he's taking fucking Especially pictures of women. Especially if you've got like a strongly <coughs> religious person, you know, like Aye. they'll yeah. they'll have a perception of that. But the same, but the same token, it's uh, as you said, it's the the opposite's happening as well. Like yeah, women want to feel liberated, and they're like this, like almost like like put themselves in that position of power. You know, like I want to do yeah. this. Whereas you're like, this is maybe make me feel a bit uncomfortable. Missy's maybe not going to be sound with it or whatever yeah. else. Like. <laughs> It's going to be even more solid. Has anybody said that to you before? It's looking to be a bit more solid. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Eh? We're getting somewhere new, Bryce. Eh? <laughs> I do have a couple of classic hard on feel stories back, um, to add to my many lists of fucking stupidity. <laughs> um, but that's certainly not for the podcast. Eh? Oh, dear, oh dear. <clears throat> But it's a fun, like, I was speaking to somebody in a band uh, recently, like somebody I used to play with, and we were we were talking about, I can't remember what band it was, it was, um, well, brand new, right, There's, there was yeah. a story about some lassie that had followed the band about, and basically the singer had sex with her every time he was in this town that she lived or whatever, and she's put out a thing out against them, kind of saying, I think we've maybe spoke about this before, when yeah. I was around here last time, Um it's the perception of what way you look at this, right? Yeah. But so basically, he was married and he was cheating on his missus just in a band pumping when he was on tour. And this girl was like, you've ruined my life. You used to have sex with me every time you came to Colorado or wherever the fuck it was. Um, and it was loads of people jumping on saying the guy was an animal and that. And it's like, see, back in the day, like, if you were in a band, like, it was just a weird kind of scene where there was like, I mean, I used to find it when I, when I played in the band, like, you would get girls that would never take an interest in you in regular life. Yeah. But after a gig, they oh, would totally. maybe kind of throw themselves at you. And see, see I'd be scared to be in a band now. unattractive men who are like, got yeah. girls throwing themselves at them. Oh, like, aye, I've I seen, see I've seen, I've seen that, that. I've It's seen weird. It. But I think it must be scary for folk in bands now. Yeah. To like, to actually like, if I don't know if a girl's maybe like, I'm trying to say this without like me saying I'm I'm against the Me Too movement because no. yeah, I was not that way at all. But like I guess it's it's a scary kind of in between time. time just Mate, now. I remember hearing stories about uh, about a, one story in particular about a lassie that came to a gig and like brought a fucking an overnight bag with a toothbrush and everything in it. Like basically <laughs> decided <laughs> I'm getting somebody's getting it. I'm not going to have a road tonight. Yeah. Like so, there's there's got to be a fine line there, you know. Uh, like pure, like, but I think it's a very you, fine line. That's the problem. I mean, everybody yeah. thinks about like you talk about like bands been away and all that, and um, like oh, like the, the touring lifestyle and like trashing hotel rooms and stuff. Like that. The reality of it is, if you're away in a band, if you're doing well, you're sharing a, a travel lodge with four yeah. other guys in your room, and the two of them are sleeping in the flare and stuff like that. So, if a lassie's willing to put herself in a position where she's coming back and she's getting road in the hotel room when there's three <laughs> other guys like in the room and stuff like that like, there's, a, there's a fine line mate between empowerment and like you say bringing an overnight bag with your toothbrush and that in it like <laughs> just wonder what I can back in it <laughs> last yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would in say on the other much. hand I don't think there's any problem at all with a girl going out and saying I want to have sex tonight uh, and I don't see any other in, the same, in the same in the same sense like, that a guy could do it I absolutely yeah, not so there's but no I, issue with that I know but I've never ever went out and take my toothbrush with me in a night out well then you're not a very prepared man <laughs> no, I'm not ill prepared for that <laughs> But no, I, I appreciate it as scary and I think there will be a lot of people just right holding now it doubting when you themselves. meet a lassie. Oh. <laughs> All right, then. I'll be saying... <laughs> just so you know, I'm prepped for the night. To be honest, I am... That's, so, a, that's a scarier angle, I think. I, I did tell you when you told me this, I'm a self-professed party girl and back in the day when I was a, a heavy party girl, I would go to parties with an overnight bag because I knew I wouldn't have be been home for three days. <laughs> so I said there is a balance to that as well, you know, like how do you get judged for that and how do people perceive you? And 
On the other hand, it's a scary time for guys and I'm sure so many people are, are doubting themselves right now of going, shit, I met this girl, she was really drunk. Wait, what was that? And that must be really quite intimidating. But on the Maybe other she's hand... she's definitely game or whatever. Right? Yeah. But on the other hand, I've watched guys in bands abuse their position of power as well. Oh, 100%. I mean, there must be... Mm-hmm. Too much. Too much. They're preying on the fact that these girls are looking up to them and the young girls are impressionable and they're really drunk and really, if they're decent men, I know you want your end away, but come on. like. See, that's one good thing. Like now <coughs> you won't get as many stories of bands no. putting themselves, that using position. that power because, yeah. because if cunts like Harvey Weinstein and that, yeah. and uh, people actually bringing it to light, it's, I mean, it is crazy how things used to be. I, I remember yeah. I used to work in HSBC, right? And, um, there was I just joined the bank, so they have they've got this thing called core values, right? So basically, where you can't really swear on the floor and stuff like that, now. Right? Yeah. Um, and so this is hammered into you in training, and um, so I was obviously very aware of this kind of can't really swear. I need to watch what I'm saying and that. And I went along to the buzz, so it was like a department of like forty people or something, right? And um, so two of the guys. Like are the kind of heads of this department and so we're all in a buzz like 44 because I said like just kind of stand there and they started talking about something and there was a girl um, who was a bit of a party girl um, that was she was actually my team leader at the time and she was standing next to the two guys and somebody said something about Donna being I shouldn't have said the name <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've said where it was as well. Donna um, HBC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, girl. For the buzz. Uh, and they were like, so they basically they were like something about her being on her knees, right? And uh, then they were like, ah, it's not the first time you've been on your knees, right? On the butt. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, I literally, it was my yeah. first day in work, like on in my team. And I was like, and they, uh, they really took it far. It was hand gestures. And I was like, oh no, my God, I can't okay. believe it. She and she just kind of laughed it off in that. But that was like, that wasn't that long ago. That was like, but the thing is, like, (laughs) it is. And a lot of people would perceive that and say, yeah, but she laughed, but I've been that girl. Of course, she laughed. What are you going to do? Because I I didn't want to seem stupid to guys. I didn't want to seem like a wee dafty or a girl that caused a fuss. I've been that girl and I've just went, ha, that's okay. And I've walked away and been like, I'm fucking raging at that. But I wouldn't say it. Right, I mean that, that'll, that's imprinted uh-huh. in my mind forever like I can't and I bet she walked away that day and was absolutely furious she would she wouldn't she'd have just been ha just so that she still get her pals and they're having a wee laugh with her you know and it's a, it's a maybe, shitty position to be in maybe we went to the pictures last night and obviously Debbie's still on her crutches so we were sitting Nando's getting something to eat before we went up to the cinema and uh I was going to walk it along to Sainsbury's to get the snacks in and that because what maniac pays the fucking cinema prices for popcorn and a bag <laughs> yeah. of sweets and what's stuff what's your right? your method of sneaking them in you get massive and handbag bag, right <laughs> so I comes back to Nando's with the, the bag of snacks of popcorn and the chocolates and the juice and that and then she says just after you left two guys come up and fucking chapped the windy we're sitting at a table at the windy like they were, they were walking past in the shop and I like totally banging the windy put their faces right up against it because I was sitting myself <laughs> And I just had to turn away and just be like, I'm so embarrassed. And I was like, you were literally going a minute. Oh <laughs> a minute. Fucking like. lad Bible cunts, man. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Still exists. <laughs> I know. Aye. But we're getting, as you said, we're getting there. It is definitely getting better. And I, don't, I never want to sound one-sided because I know that there's men that have been put in positions as well. And yeah, I'm a feminist, but that doesn't mean that I ignore the fact that men go through shit as well you know and I think that's parents. more <clears throat> I was going to mention I think that's more prominent um, in high school yeah do you know what I mean and I think yeah you do get your, your your high school kids that will take advantage of women but I think there's also and I, I know from um, teachers personally that have, have having to deal with this that you'll have the young girl crying abuse not, yeah. maybe not rape but no, sexual but abuse he whatever done but this, he done this uh, he, mm-hmm. And he's been totally innocent. Yep. And that can genuinely ruin kids' lives. I don't, oh, I don't definitely. know how many kids' lives that's ruined that have been genuinely innocent or haven't done a thing. Do you know what I mean? And that's that's a scary thought. I can't yeah. imagine what that'd have been like. It. I've uh, personally your tarnish, went through. Your tarnish, uh, kind of. Exactly. What well, I personally went through a family friend's false rape allegation, and what's bad is this girl had falsely accused three people, 
and he was a good family friend and it got thrown out of court but the stigma stayed with him uh, well forever he was then. called uh, the rapist yeah. since then God, and right, that's not a nickname you want no I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, and, and you might know me I know. my mate's coming out for drinks tonight the rapist <laughs> I know. So that's that, that, they got that, cleared. That. No, oh, quite, pretty oh, quickly. Aye. And this yeah. girl ended up getting herself in a lot of trouble because, I mean, there must be something wrong with the girl to be able to, yeah. to want to be doing that. Whatever was going on with her, but that never so left that guy. Fucking damaging man. Like, that, oh, that, they need to throw the book at that. No, like, I to, think, and I, I will <clears> say <throat> hand and heart that if you've falsely claimed rape and it is proven undeniably so, that's a charge. Oh, you've, ruined like a, you've ruined someone's life like you've ruined someone's life and because that will carry with them it's the same with murder and stuff like or whatever allegation if someone's questioned no one forgets it yeah. no one forgets it I listen to true crime podcasts and people get dragged in for questioning and nothing to do with it but no one well look at making a murderer oh my yeah. god it's like yeah, crazy. God, crazy it's story. crazy like so no I do I see it from everyone's perce- perspective I was just thinking of somebody that was like uh, Donna. No. Donna. <laughs> Donna Fate, no, SBC, who plays uh, in Partick or something. Donna like signed my ticket, Lassie. Uh, I'll stick up for you, Donna. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, like I'm. St- I would still like we still. We're no, we're no in touch of that, but like I, I still see her every now and then. She's a great Lassie. Um, no, I was thinking of. Yeah. 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 Mate, if you can zoom in on that, that would be good, man. <laughs> Scuddy. No danger. <laughs> That's got to be an outtake, man. Oh, yeah. Uh, edited. I don't even know what I was talking about now, man. Mate, you want uh, another cup of tea? Is that a hint? I no, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm good, man. I've had about five cups of them. Maybe that's why I'm banging the heat. Um, oh. No, I was thinking of somebody, I think me and you were talking about a person we were like, is he no a pedo? Oh, <laughs> God. Neil Buchanan but we were like I see, I see somebody thought no. he was a pedo so somebody not. thought I the guy for a heart attack Aye. there was a, I'm sure there was at one point some sort of rumour mill see I can't even sure it's it's if that goes out if that goes out you're like you. just ah, from somebody saying it sticks with you that's it's twice Cliff we've, we've mentioned well. see Cliff Richards one that you always hear about but I think mm-hmm. that's people just saying about you he's next to come no he uh, went through, but it's so unfair he went through, he went through accusations <laughs> he did and oh got, did he yeah. but it's right. like uh, like Kevin Bridges thing like the I like big pedo specs pedo haircut <laughs> like big pedo beard and that like, oh, yeah, like right, steady on it <laughs> <laughs> Big pedo's looking at you, kid, eh? Fucking hell, man. You're hitting the silver cup. My God. The classic signs of a pedo, eh? Big pedo headphones. It's brutal, man. But imag- imagine, mm. like, somebody just fucking manufactured a- an accusation against you. Like, your but name would just get fucking dragged through the mud, yeah. mate. Like, you fucked. It wouldn't matter whether you <clears throat> were cleared because it people's matter. attention spans are so short that they'll fucking forget about whatever happened yeah. in the long term and just remember yeah. in that moment that this guy was fucking well, you remember the most significant things yeah. it's like that's why you always remember the good stuff and the bad stuff never the stuff but in I, between humans tend to really remember the one bad thing people did yeah. even if they didn't do it it's like that one bad rumour that one bad instant like they do by nature we do we don't remember yeah. It was it's like the Lost Prophets. We forgot about all their bangers, oh, man. Oh my <laughs> that's God. the thing. You know, we versus Dragon Ninja was a no. <laughs> no one, no one no. can go back and listen no. to any Lost Prophets. Just. I couldn't. No, no, you can't. No. You can't. Well, his voice. Do you know, his, his, his voice was shocking anyway, to be fair. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, he makes my skin crawl, I can't honestly. watch episodes of Art Attacks. I'm unsure. If no, Neil Buchanan I, don't is a think, I don't think Neil Buchanan ever done anything wrong. Right, he's been class. He's, he's, he's fine. He's fine. He's all right. I can download those episodes again. Don't know about Pat Sharp, but we'll get there. <laughs> Pat. Pat Sharp, mate. Oh, I don't what, think Pat Sharp. We, we were about talking about him, but he's, he's, he's coming to town soon, Pat Sharp. Where have we, we talked about that recently? In the it twins? was that, uh, what's her name? Elizabeth, no, uh, Chrissy McMurdy. Christy. So that was just like... Because <laughs> you're like... <laughs> <laughs> stirring past in at the <laughs> night. You're <laughs> 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 like... <laughs> Are the twins <laughs> coming? Are the twins coming? Are the twins Oh. Uh, that's right I was asking her she's like who's the twins what say, oh my who days. doesn't know those fucking twins every yeah. young boy's dream <laughs> Jesus man great <laughs> <laughs> oh. dream oh, guys I think honestly on that no I think we've been fucking chatting for a, 
a bit of a million dollars. I think so. Time, and I, let's fucking wrap up there and um, thanks for fucking yeah, good welcoming into your humble abode and gaining some beers and pizza and wedges and do you want another cup of tea though Bruce seriously mate <laughs> <laughs> to get me up the road <laughs> let's get another cup of tea and another cup of things aye, so aye, we can have a wee couple off camera and I'll tell you that story that I was going to tell you aye, mate honestly um, thanks guys. for coming over it's been thank brilliant you much, it's guys. been really lovely I've thank really you. enjoyed yeah, it thank you good luck with uh, the new hip hip I cannot wait <laughs> he's going to come see me on stage throwing it about magic who will do <laughs> excellent <laughs> right catch you bye Cheers.